Luckily for this is that this allows us to, to um, access and get the participation of a lot of other people who would not be able to participate with us. So uh, welcome to everybody and uh, welcome to everybody who is celebrating the fall equinox in its many different types of forms and uh, processes. And so um, one of the interesting things that uh, folks who have participated with us in our virtual festivals from uh, this year from Beltane to PSG to uh, Green Spirit will note is that we are using yet a different platform. Um, that is because uh, we are working on trying to figure out what is the best what platform. Is the best this allows us to uh, access and okay. participation. We're doing great. Apologies, we had a we had a feedback issue of us watching ourselves. We are experiencing new platforms, and we just figured something out about this platform. So it's a learning experience for everybody. A timely learning experience. <clears throat> um, that being said, uh, we thank you for being here. But there is going to be very very limited technical help if you run into an issue. Um, we uh, like we're not going to be able to uh, access everybody and get everybody help. Um, but we'll see what we can do if, um, as things emerge and as things come in. So um, to introduce myself, um, my name is uh, Paul Herrick. I am a member of Circle Sanctuary. Uh, some of you who come to PSG will also know me as truly, um, I'm, uh, some people know me as the drama llama guy. And I am one of the uh, coordinators for the virtual welcome fall as a part of this festival. My name is Hollis. Um, I've been a member with Circle Sanctuary for a few years now. This is my first festival that I've ever coordinated. And so I'm super excited to be doing it with Truly. Thank you, Truly. Um, and I have been running around Circle for almost four years now. So not a very long time, but a long enough that people can vaguely recognize the blur shape that I make when I pass them. Um, and so it's, it's really great to be uh, doing this with everybody and it's really great to be coordinating my first festival even in the current situation that we're in with COVID-19. And so just to let everybody know is that there's a lot of people who uh, who it took to make this festival happen. Um, it's, it's just not these two jokers right here who put this all together. Um, behind the scenes uh, coordinating all the video feeds and all the technical stuff and did a lot of work on some of the uh, some of the pre-recorded videos that you're going to see. Um, is uh, Bob Paxton, uh, who is a regular feature at Circle Sanctuary and also a regular feature at PSG. Additionally, um, our festival uh, manager, uh, Sharon Moonfeather, is uh, very much responsible for uh, herding these two cats and uh, trying to keep us on task. <clears throat> and also trying to generally uh, coordinate the scope of the festivals across the, across the year. Additionally, we had some guidance from uh, Selena Fox, our high priestess and uh, head of Circle Sanctuary, as well as um, our office staffer, uh, Emily, who uh, has uh, just recently departed the position. So thank you, Emily, for all the help that you gave us in this, uh, in this process. Additionally, we will be having some guest presenters as a form of a special video. They're not going to be presenting live with us today, but uh, we have uh, some of them may be participating with us um, as a part of uh, this live stream and uh, virtual event. And so we'll they will uh, be able to introduce themselves when the panels uh, are coming up. Additionally, our ritual today uh, that's going to end and sort of capstone the festival is going to be put on by uh, Reverend Florence Edwards Miller at the end of the day. And we're very excited to have Florence doing that ritual. It was one of the things that we really wanted out of this festival. Yeah, um, Florence has oftentimes seen, uh, you might know Florence from uh, PSG or from one of our other festivals uh, doing family programming, uh, but we decided to ask her to do one of our uh, main slot rituals because we'd uh, like to have a different access in terms of ideas about where she wanted to go with it. Anything else in terms of any other people that were involved? Uh, no, I think we've hit the nail on the head with just about everybody. Cool. All right, so <clears throat> just to lay out the shape of the day as it's going to go on, um, we're going to be having uh, presentations. Most presentations are going to be lasting about an hour. Um, 
And of that hour, we're going to be having uh, 50 minutes worth of presentation in, its, uh, in itself. And then we'll be having a 10 minute break between presentations. During that time, uh, we're, or during the break time, we will, uh, Bob will be showing us some videos of the land that uh, he has taken and some of his ventures um, out to uh, Circle Sanctuary land proper. Um, and do, 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 do. So if you have uh, if you have questions during or if we're going to prompt you for questions uh, during a presentation or during a live presentation, um, please type those in the YouTube chat. Uh, we will try to get to them as best as we are able to. Um, the interesting thing about it is that Hollis and I are going to be seeing the questions stream past. So uh, we'll pick up the ones that we uh, can get and that we can access fairly easily and <clears throat> uh, try to repeat uh, any notable points that we have here. And it's looking like you all know how to use the chat feature already, and it's looking very, very lively, and cool. I'm very excited that it's working well. All right. Yeah. Cool. So just to lay out for folks for the theme of the day um, is that uh, this year, uh, the theme that Hollis and I were working with is protection magic. And <clears throat> What's kind of interesting about the theme of the year is that we weren't even really thinking of, we weren't even thinking about protection magic like after COVID. Like when we first picked up the festival and we first decided we want to do Welcome Fall in like February, mm -hmm. we were thinking, let's do something protection themed. Like mm -hmm. this is a really important year for everybody. It's probably a really difficult time, especially around this time of year. And we didn't really realize at the time how difficult it was actually going to be. So it was definitely a really, you know, like serendipitous sort of idea for us to come up with that for the theme. But um, <laughs> it definitely worked out well in terms of being able to direct things as we went. Yeah, and uh, I think one of the interesting things about this is, um, and I'm going to uh, delve into this a little bit more during my live presentation, but. Uh, some of you might be asking, how does protection magic uh, fit in with the harvest time? And <clears throat> uh, that is a good and useful question. And the way that I've been working with this is, well, uh, to be honest, because I wanted to see something a little bit interesting and a little bit uh, different, because every year we have uh, harvest time stuff. Also, um, as we started going on and the COVID quarantine was ramping up, yeah. A lot of us are not going to be getting out quite as much in order to do a lot of these harvest time activities. So it was probably a good opportunity to do so, to do something and to work with a concept that was a little bit more, um, let's call it near and dear to us, uh, or at least to, to our, our present circumstances. But one of the ways that it does relate to harvest time is that at the equinox, the um, light and darkness as a part of the year come into balance. And one of the things that um, feeling protected and feeling safe can uh, help us do is it can also help us uh, bring us into balance. And so we wanted to work with the different traditions and concepts and show you sort of the breadth of uh, the breadth. The breadth. You got the word. You're nailing breadth. it. <laughs> okay. Of uh, protective practices across different traditions and different ideas. Um, okay, so just to uh, to reiterate for those of you who haven't seen the schedule yet, um, we did, I believe, uh, squish the schedule a little bit. So we're not actually leaving a, uh, a lunch break because we figure that folks are accessing us in different ways and different uh, on different devices and in, under different circumstances. So we don't necessarily need like we have a physical in person festival. Um, to have a break for lunch. So you're not going to have to hear me like I do almost like all the time whenever I'm working in the kitchen, tell you about what utensils that you're going to need when uh, when we're taking lunch at a festival. Unfortunately, I won't be able to give people my spiel this time, but you know, like it's just one of those horrible things that you're going to miss during COVID. Huh. <clears throat> so the, pre the next presentation uh, after this is, <clears throat> I'm going to be uh, giving folks a introduction to uh, uh, to protection magic and um, and different protection practices that I have been talking with people uh, since we started conceptualizing uh, this festival and to try and set a grounding for uh, like how do people understand protection 
uh, where does it go and what does it do? Um, after that, we're going to have a pre-recorded panel with uh, three guests. Um, uh, Laura Gonzalez uh, from Chicago, uh, Wade Mueller from uh, Northern Wisconsin, and Byron Ballard from um, Asheville, North Ash Carolina. Asheville, North Carolina. No. Um, after that, we're going to be having a family programming talking about familiars. Um, and if you don't actually have a, uh, and it's going to be pre-recorded because. Um, so we're going to be doing a family programming with familiars. I'm going to talk very, uh, just a brief sort of thing in the beginning about familiars and like their importance and protection and what they can mean. And if you don't have a familiar at home or you don't have a, you don't have a pet that can be considered a familiar, that's okay because I am going to be uh, showing you how to do origami and it was pre-recorded because trying to do origami on a live stream is a bit difficult especially when you have uh, children involved so it'll be really easy also so that way if um, I do each origami piece twice for the kids and so if you need a little bit of help um, you can like go back in the video and you can kind of like rewatch things and but I try to make the instructions as clear as possible. And so we make three different origami animals. They all help with like different aspects of like learning things about yourself and doing different kinds of like uh, familiar protection. And so I think that uh, that's going to be a really good time. Cool. And then so after the origami presentation, uh, Selena Fox will give us a presentation on um, herbs for protection and well-being, which will include a, a discussion of witch bottles. And I think that we're actually going to, if I recall correctly, we're going to have a, a craft involving a witch bottle, maybe. Maybe. Or she'll just describe it. Anyway, <clears throat> um, after that is uh, Hollis is going to be another pre-recorded thing yeah. on doorway magic. Um, so I'm going to be doing a panel that is going to be a craft spell where you are going to have a doorway, and I'm going to be talking about um, Romani magic and kind of just a brief. Uh, I say brief, it's most of the panel. It's going to be an overview about uh, Romani magic and kind of like explaining uh, Romani, uh, Romani magic like as a practice, both as like, uh, both as like a general concept and then in terms of like my own practice. Mm. And then we're going to be doing a craft with a doorway. And so um, if you are interested in doing that craft, um, you, the materials required are a container of water doesn't have to be a bucket, but it does have to be like at least bowl shaped. So more than a cup, but less than a five gallons. Um, and then a rag, um, some salt and some chalk. And so that'll be kind of the base ingredients that you'll need for the Romani doorway magic spell. And I'm very excited that I get to bring it to circle because I don't think it's like anything that most people have ever seen before. And, and that is your background. Is yeah, it, that you, is my background. You, you are Romani. Yes. Okay. I should have clarified. Thank you. <laughs> um, uh, and lastly, we're going to, uh, like after the doorway magic, we're going to be having our ritual with uh, Florence. And the ritual was uh, pre-recorded out on Circle Sanctuary land in, uh, the, uh, in the prairie restoration area of Circle. And it was done in all of its sort of like fall transition fullness. And so you'll see a lot of the last uh, wildflowers of the season and also uh, see a lot of uh, wonderful stuff. Changing colors of the leaves. Oh, less changing colors at that point. There's definitely stuff darkening up. Yeah. So um, that's wonderful. Uh, other materials that we recommend for today, we recommend also uh, keeping writing utensils and uh, writing uh, subst uh, substrates handy if, in case you have a super cool idea and you want to write it down. <clears throat> Or you can just use Microsoft Word or like a notebook because you know you're watching stuff online. <laughs> I want to be inclusive of the folks who are using mobile devices. That's fair too. Okay. So since we have a little bit of time left, and I've seen that we've already have some people uh, doing some commentary about this, I'd like uh, you guys to have an opportunity to introduce yourself. Introduce yourselves. Um, so. I would first like to ask, like, since this is a virtual event and we can get people much farther away than we are in uh, Wisconsin right now, whereabouts are you from? So the chat does take a minute to catch up. So in the meantime, I know it's it's not entirely like it's not live live. It's okay. 
But um, I can see from our chat now, I'm going to reach over and look at your mouse. We've got Gretchen Tate from Minneapolis. We've got We've got Liz G from Northern Michigan. We've got Robin from McFarland. Hi, Robin. Uh, we've got, let's see, uh, that is that is Wisconsin. Do you wanna do you wanna take a crack at that? Because that's a Wisconsin town name and I don't know Wisconsin towns yet. I'm from Indiana, so I clearly am not very good at uh Lac de Flambeau. Lac de no. Flambeau. I, I hope that's it. Yeah. Otherwise it's not going to be. Mm -hmm. um, and then here, keep scrolling up. Who else do we have? Um, Orlando, Florida. Yeah, you're having a much nicer, sunnier Maybon than we are, and I am eternally jealous. Uh, we have uh, Bree from New York. Hi, Bree. We haven't yeah. seen you in a while. Oh my gosh, it's so nice to see Bree. And let's see here. Uh, West Kentucky. Hey, we have Nick from uh, Kentucky. Uh, it's like, hi, Nick. We haven't seen you a while up here in Wisconsin. We've got Darlene Shaw from San Diego, California, which, again, I'm very jealous of how warm it must be there. Actually, I'm not entirely jealous of San Diego right now. It's very warm for uh, other reasons as well. And I hope that you are being safe <clears throat> in this time. Uh, and Chicago. Oh, it's Jake. Hello, Jake. It's nice to see you in Chicago. Yeah. So. Here, let's scroll back down and see if we've got any uh, new sort of things. Okay, um, we've got lots of people from Wisconsin and Madison and Northfield, Illinois and Los Angeles, California. Again, I hope you were being safe. And New Jersey and Colorado, Steamboat Springs, Colorado, Syracuse, New York, Richmond, Virginia, um, Johnson Creek, Wisconsin. Yeah, it's it's a really, you know, like widespread and again of people that we normally <laughs> wouldn't get if uh, if we were conducting this like in person yeah. on circle land. So this is it's really exciting to be able to bring this to a bunch of different people from a bunch of different places so far away. We're, yeah, it's really cool. We're all the way from the Eastern time zone to the Pacific time zone. This Holy is amazing. Cats. Um, <clears throat> which I can't imagine how early it must be for them to be in the Pacific time zone. Because I mean, like this. Oh, is, Oregon too. Oh yeah, and you know. Right. That's super early in the morning. That's far too early for me. <laughs> I like it at this time. Um. So let's see. We've got states represented. Um. Let's talk about paths or traditions. Yeah, and since part of today is about talking about the breadth of how people understand things in different paths and traditions, let's hear about uh, folks and uh, what uh, spiritual path do they follow as a part of this, uh, like a great melting pot of our uh, festival experience. Yeah, and since we have to wait for the chat to catch up in order to hear about other people's paths, um, uh, I'll go into my path real quick. I'm eclectic. Mm -hmm. um, I worship a lot of different traditions. Um, I was raised pagan. Both of my parents are pagan. My mom is much more of a chaos magician. You say turn north, she turns south. You say go uh, clockwise, she goes Wittershins. That's her sort of practice. My dad um, also, uh, my dad is much more like quiet, like self solitary practice. He was in the Navy. And so he kind of like <clears throat> kept his practice to himself. Um, but he is also like a Romani practitioner. And so I kind of uh, had both of those traditions filtered down onto me. Um, one of my main uh, goddesses that I kind of follow around and like just kind of like think about a lot is the Morrigan. Hmm. And so that's sort of one of my hmm. uh, major goddesses. And then one of my major gods is Anubis. So I kind of I kind of have a widespread of people that I like. And I also um, practice Romani magic that I learned from my grandmother, um, which we will talk about more in the panel. So what about you, Truly? What do you practice? Uh, so for me, um, I guess religiously and sort of my worship uh, ways, I'm I'm very Wiccanate. I've accessed sort of the god and goddess uh, typology and the wheel of the year sort of thing. Um, in my magical practice, I'm much more, uh, uh, I guess, sort of have a free mix of uh, hermetic uh, magic and uh, folk magic. Although folks who know me uh, from festivals recently would probably know me much more as sort of a kitchen witch, quite literally, because normally I would be cooking in the kitchen. I'm pretty sure that even if even though you're coordinating this festival, you would be cooking in the kitchen right now if you were having it on Circle Land. 
and I would just be on the radio going, truly, truly, you need to get out of the kitchen. <clears throat> so here, do you want to read? Yeah. So um, it's so some of the folks that we have represented here are um, Ramova, an indigenous uh, Lithuanian pagan religion. I apologize if I am uh, mispronouncing this. We have a uh, folks who uh, do a pagan Wiccan uh, Unitarian Universalist Sufi mix. Uh, folks who are Celtic Wiccan oriented and have Druidic influences, um, eclectic, eclectic, eclectic. Ecl uh, you missed eclectic AF. Oh yes, in indeed. Well, I think that's one of the interesting thing about uh, uh, and, and with me trying to uh, give a focus on different traditions, sort of at the edges to be able to stake out where the edges of pagan practice are. The thing is, is that many, uh, many pagans are eclectic because they incorporate like paganism is a living uh, thing. It's a living religion. People incorporate and develop things as they come through. You could say it's not a monolith. Like other religions are going to be talking about today. That's true. Oh, hey, and we have folks who are also uh, include Buddhism as a part of their Wiccan and neo uh, pagan practice. Um, Druidic, let's see here, Hecatean. Um, <clears throat> solitary practitioners with strong Celtic leanings, which we always love our solitaries, which again is really great that we can present this to them within the comfort of their own homes. And then of course we have Circle Craft by Selena Fox. Yep, and Selena's uh, own innovations uh, to uh, pagan practice. Well, nice. cool. Well, thank you, everybody. Um, so before we uh, head into our next presentation, uh, I, I'm going to take a little bit of a break, and uh, Hollis is going to take a little break, and we're going to uh, give you some video of the land. So thank you very much, and we'll see you in a couple of minutes for introduction to Protection Magic. Well, he'll see you. That's your panel. That's right. It is. <laughs> I will see you later when we do, hopefully, a question and answer portion after my panel on Romani Magic. Cool. Thank you, everybody. We'll see you in a bit.
Um, this is truly a gem. And so the first thing that we wanted to do for today uh, when we were planning it is um, talk about protection um, as sort of a broader concept because uh, when Hollis and I uh, in February started talking about this and uh, like sitting around um, in a, oh, the, the halcyon days of being able to sit in a bar and talk about something, uh, we realized that there was a lot of uh, different uh, ways that you can think about protection. And um, so one of the big grounding things in protection is uh, at least protection magic and protection practices uh, throughout the ages and in uh, contemporary pagan practice is sort of the, the answer to the age old question of why do bad things happen to good people? And the response from a lot of magical people is, well, they shouldn't. And so um, to that end, um, it has become sort of a uh, one of possibly the largest uh, magical preoccupations is with protection. And so this is probably a, this is probably right on, like protection as a concept and uh, like a magical operation that people engage in. It's uh, probably right up there with. Uh, money and love as uh, like as some of the biggest things that people want to know about. So um, before I, I get too far into talking about uh, my notes and thoughts on this, um, I want to make sure that I give you guys a little bit of background and as to my grounding. So I already uh, talked a little bit about in the introduction, but I'll reiterate it here is that so my personal magical practice uh, sort of religiously is grounded in the uh, Wiccanate uh, tradition or the sort of Wiccan background that celebrates the Wheel of the Year, accesses the God and Goddess, um, and uh, looks to uh, a sort of an animistic pantheon of uh, creatures that exist around, of uh, non-physical creatures that exist around us. My magical tradition is sort of a free mix of uh, Wiccanate magic um, hermetic mysticism and uh, uh, folk magic, which uh, focuses primarily on kitchen witchery. And so that's um, that's sort of my practice. Um, at the same time, uh, sort of my intellectual background comes from anthropology. I have a master's degree in sociocultural anthropology um, that I got at this point a decade ago. Uh, where I studied a lot of magical practices from around the world and a lot of religious practices around the world. So I'm going to be drawing on some of that um, past knowledge and information uh, to talk about some of what's going on. Uh, additionally, um, my uh, like I'm somebody's going to like somebody may say otherwise, but I like to think that I, I have read pretty widely as a part of Western mysticism and uh, Western occultism. So the limitation there is that I don't have a really great understanding of uh, a lot of the Eastern or uh, like uh, South Central Asian uh, philosophies and or even uh, the uh, Muslim uh, philosophies on uh, spiritual protection, uh, protection and uh, magic and mysticism. So there will be a couple of opportunities for doing questions and answers. And I would love it if folks uh, who have a different perspective would like to um, add to the perspective that we have here. That being said, um, I'm going to go and tell you about my perspective just so we can widen this a little bit. So when we're talking about magical protection, um, I start with Diane Fortune's definition of magic, which is the art and science of causing change in, in consciousness in accordance with will. And uh, that will uh, be familiar to some of you as, as who somebody else who used that definition, uh, which was the uh, which was Aleister Crowley, um, and was probably the person who made that definition more famous. But it's the grounding that I have in trying to understand and define. Hey, what's magic? And so um, I'll repeat it again here. It's like, so what is uh, what is protection and protection magic have to do with the equinox? And um, to expand on a little bit more of what I talked about in the introduction, 
Um, this has been, um, as Hollis and I have been developing the programming for this and developing the concepts and ideas that have gone through this, one of the things that has come up is that this has become a really hard year for a lot of people. In a lot of cases, things that are uh, people feel are out of their control. And the harvest time and the equinox time is a lot about bringing balance um, to a lot of different things, is that um, in the course of the day, um, the amount of light and dark in the day are coming into balance. Uh, by the way, the equinox is on the 22nd, uh, for those of you who don't, on Tuesday the 22nd, for those of you who don't know. And uh, one of the things that we wanted to talk about, since we probably weren't going to be uh, directly celebrating the harvest season in its full harvest glory, is um, how to bring balance within ourselves because it's been such a hard time. And there's a lot of things right now and a lot of stuff swirling around, especially regarding with COVID, um, that we can't control directly. But um, one of the things uh, drawing back to uh, Diane Fortune's definitions and uh, causing changes in consciousness is to bring ourselves into balance uh, using protective practices. So any questions, comments, and or complaints before I move on? And I know there's going to be a couple of moments of uh, I uh, catch up here. So, <clears throat> so you get to see me dance. All right, I'll circle back to uh, any questions that come up, but I'm gonna move on. So um, let's start off with uh, what is protection? So broadly, uh, protection as a concept, as a magical operation, and as a thing that people pursue cross-culturally is, uh, is the lessening of bad circumstances. <clears throat> and to repeat uh, the, the definition of magic, uh, from Diane Fortune is, uh, uh, for Stephen, is it is the uh, art and science of causing changes in consciousness in accordance with will. So protection is lessening bad circumstances is a pretty broad definition, but also protection practices themselves are um, pretty uh, pretty hugely broad. Uh, hey, Diane. And um, so the other funny thing about protection practices is that it borders um, on the edges of a lot of other magical operations as people see them. And we're going to get into this when I start talking about uh, different types of uh, protection practices as I see them. Um, but it also borders on things like banishings, where you try and get rid of something bad. Um, purification, also trying to get something rid of something bad that's like less well known. Like banishing is you have something that you know that's bad and you can point to it kind of um, and you try and get rid of it. And purification is trying to uh, rid generalized badness. Sort of, I guess, like the, the, the metaphor of like point and non-point pollution sources. Um, there's also a lot of overlap with uh, concepts of prayer and communication with, uh, with deity, because talking about this saying that uh, prayer has a, uh, some traditions and some uh, co magical concepts consider prayer to have a protective quality to it. The, um, one, of the, one of the interesting things about protection and protection magic is that um, one of the core things in magical operations is um, your intention. Uh, it's the thing that you want to accomplish. And generally speaking, when you're working with, uh, with magical operations in Western uh, traditions, what you want is you want a very honed intention. You want something very specific that you're trying to accomplish, which sort of makes protection uh, a really um, odd duck 
because it's sort of hard to pull off protection magic specifically unless you have something really uh, uh, really uh, pointed that you want to uh, it, engage in protection from like hey I like there's this person who is bothering me and I want them to not bother me and you can specifically point to that but that thing but if you're trying to go with I want to be protected that has less of a specific uh, like a grounding or uh, a specific magical grounding <clears throat> Um, on top of that, um, if you try to do a general protection spell, um, to try and be perfectly protected, being perfectly protected is sort of a um, sort of a good thing, bad thing. What the idea is is that no bad circumstances can get to you. Um, but when putting up those sorts of barriers, part of the problems that uh, you have is that a perfectly protected individual oftentimes is, uh, also shutting out a lot of other things that they, at the point in time when they uh, created the protection, did not necessarily recognize as good, which is one of the things that makes uh, that sort of magic problematic. So it's it's sort of hard uh, to, to get a really good protection spell. Um, that being said, um, in, in folk traditions, there's a lot of protection charms and generalized protection uh, practices that um, have been in existence for an extremely long period in time. And those, uh, <clears throat> sorry, one second, letting my brain catch up to my, letting my brain uh, catch up to my mouth. So those protection charms and uh, some of them that people might be familiar with are certain types of protective stones, protective amulets, uh, traditional uh, like things like uh, red salt bags, um, uh, uh, talismans to advert the evil eye, and other traditional practices uh, are that are part of folk magic traditions have uh, a lot of weight behind them in uh, magical weight because they've been practiced for a long period of time. And so um, it sometimes makes the difference between uh, having to craft a really specific uh, protection spell in a Western mystical uh, idea, and then also being able to um, have a generalized protection around you at all times. So um, another concept that I work with as a part of uh, my magical practice is the, uh, is the concept of the layers of reality. And uh, it, it will probably be pretty familiar to a couple of different, or to folks in the audience. Is that there is a physical reality that we all work with, but then there's other realities that are sort of stacked on top or sort of stacked together as uh, different frequencies or different, uh, sort of levels of energy that are uh, uh, put together. And magical operations can operate on a lot of uh, on a lot of different layers of reality. So there's a lot of people who recognize like a mental layer of reality. And there's also folks who recognize or well, I work with one of them as a sort of cultural or archetypal <clears throat> uh, or social layer of reality that has stuff that exists between people. Um, there's all in magical operations. We also sometimes talk about the etheric or the energetic layer of reality, um, where we have life energy that uh, runs through us, and also the astral layer of reality, where we have um, where we uh, Western mysticism contends that a lot of the non-physical entities exist uh, that a lot of us work with on a day-to-day -day or sometimes day-to-day -day basis. So one of the interesting things about that is that uh, protection can take different forms. And so I'm gonna go through in a moment and talk about uh, different types of protection that when I've been talking with folks, uh, I've been able to dig up. And most of them exist on um, one of three different layers of reality. Uh, we have what we would, uh, for, uh, for a magical operation, we have sort of an etheric, astral, spiritual, energetic protection type 
um, that includes a lot of spells and things like that. Uh, we also have social protections um, that uh, a lot of people who are magical folk and who work with magical operations utilize. Um, these also sort of uh, overlap a little bit with energetic protections, but we'll talk about that when we get there. Another really important uh, layer of protection here is also the mental protections, or uh, one might call them philosophical protections. Um, I'm including them here. Uh, I'm going to include a little bit of a, a, a like talk about them um, because we're talking in uh, trying to bring balance in, involving uh, magic and mental disciplines can also bring uh, a change in consciousness in accordance with will because if you can shift your viewpoint uh, to different to access different ideas and different viewpoints you have performed a magical operation so any questions there before i move on and yes you'll probably get to see me dance again because i'm I'm, I'm trying to fill space while there's a gap between uh, people responding and uh, the video that you're seeing. Repeat again for anybody who didn't catch it. Any questions, comments, and complaints on uh, talking about protection generally before we move on? Okay, so to get back into it, um, let's start by talking about um, <clears throat> different types of protections that you might re uh, recognize. And part of this in talking about like all these different stuff that I've dug up in terms of how uh, pagan folk and magical folk have protected themselves is to try and uh, talk about how, how big and how broad is uh, protection and protection practices and what they protect against and what they protect for and how they're protecting things and this, that, and the other thing. Um, <clears throat> oh. Yes. So some of you might, uh, uh, just as a, as a note, some of you uh, might be hearing noises in my background. Um, and what that is, is that my apartment complex decided that to, today was the day that they were going to replace the roof. Well, actually, a couple of days ago they started, but they're continuing working through the weekend in order to take advantage of the dry weather. And so there might be a couple of drilling noises in the background. So uh, don't mind that. Anyway, returning. So let's uh, first talk about uh, like sort of traditionally magical energetic, etheric, or astral uh, types of protections. And 
Um, the, the first group is what a lot of folks are going to, is, so if they've practiced magic in a Western tradition are probably familiar with, which is sort of warding and shielding. And broadly warding and shielding is a protective practice that um, uh, creates a barrier that sets aside space by now not allowing bad circumstances into the space. And the, if you have uh, cast a circle as a part of your magical tradition, if you have uh, put up a ward to uh, create some sort of set aside space, um, that's the core of uh, warding and shielding as a magical practice. What it is is that you're setting intentions to say, this is a space where, uh, where uh, things cannot get in, thing, and this is the space where uh, things can exist. Generally speaking, when people are, uh, are using it as part of, say, a magical ritual as a protective uh, measure, what they're doing is they're trying to protect um, the sacred space that exists within uh, the circle or within the ward. Um, uh, one of the, so if you've ever been to PSG, one of the things that uh, is done during one of the major rituals uh, at in-person PSG is the sacred hunt. And uh, uh, there is a lot of to do about <clears throat> uh, putting up the wards for the sacred hunt. And the wards, uh, they're, one of their primary things is because it's such a highly energetic, um, sort of ecstatic ritual, is to contain the energy of the ritual in and of itself. Um, but one of the other things is that um, part of it is also to set aside the ritual space as sacred space, but also to because the um, because the ritual energy for the the sacred hunt is very hunty, uh, you're also trying to uh, keep it from uh, accessing people that energy from accessing people um, who are not ready for it and it's not appropriate for them to have. So sometimes protections can go two ways in creating a container. <laughs> Protection spells for new roofs. <clears throat> Now, um, the problem with warding and shielding is that um, it it takes a lot of effort to create really good wards because you have to think of really specific. So this is what I was talking about in the last segment is that um, with a ward, you have to be really clear about what you are letting in and what you are keeping out. And if that, um, so one of the dangers of having a two, solid of a ward is you can prevent good things from coming into it. And one of the problems of having not a specific enough ward is that if your wards or shield are not specific enough, sometimes you uh, invite in things that you hadn't thought of when you originally set it up. Um, a lot of people work with a concept of um, any, like don't allow anything in that will hurt me or anything that means me malfeasance or bad stuff um, to, to get around that issue. Uh, personally, in my magical practice, I have found that sometimes that isn't, that itself is not specific enough, but it tends to be a good uh, catch-all for a lot of things. Um, additionally, this also falls into the category of uh, the practice of shielding, uh, where people uh, construct personal shields for themselves, and they're not necessarily like, so the space that they are protecting is uh, just around themselves, like on, um, and so a lot of these shields uh, sometimes in Western mysticism are called odic shields, um, and, and which has to do with uh, another name for magical force, which is the idea that there is a barrier that exists on the edge of your uh, personal space that is defined by uh, your aura, if you work with the auric concept. Um, one problem with these is that they also take a lot of focus to maintain. So uh, some, when I've had conversations with people about how they personally do shielding, they have to remind themselves to redo their shields because sometimes they forget about them and they fade away. Um, some other people don't have, uh, don't have that problem and find that their shields stay up uh, quite well throughout the day. Um, if you want to uh, leave a comment in the chat about um, like your experiences with shielding, um, but personally for me, I find that in my practice, I have to come back and refocus on shields uh, when I uh, 
when I need to sort of re-up um, that protective barrier thing. So another, another interesting part about this is uh, that warding and shielding also kind of includes a lot of things that we consider to be protective stones. Um, because a lot of the lore about protective stones uh, means that carrying the stone like an agate, a piece of obsidian, a piece of jasper on your person um, allows you to just be protected against harmful things that are coming in. Now, depending on what sort of stone lore you access and who you talk about it, stones have different um, stones have different aspects and um, ways that they protect people. But one of the sort of omnibus protection of just like saying, no, you, you, you can't touch my person is a sort of a ward or a shield. Sorry, one second. Just reading the uh, reading the chat. So I appreciate the uh, the call out for the good of all, and um, uh, that brings up sort of an interesting sort of philosophical concept in uh, in Western mysticism, uh, which is saying uh, which is the question of is there a um, is there something that is really good for uh, for everybody? And um, I I worked with that concept in the past. I found it to be fairly effective. Um, but I, there is a, a philosophical question of is there an absolute good for everybody available, including um, all of our physical and non physical entities that are around? Um, uh, at one point in time. Um, one might say what is what is good for the goose is good for the gander, um, but another question is is what is good for the goose good for the duck? I don't know, and uh, like I'm not going to dig too deeply into it, but it uh, it's sort of I think a thing that everybody has to address as part of their magical practice. Hmm. Okay, I, I appreciate um, a uh, Carmichael uh, bringing up uh, something as part of Eastern practice as a uh, a practice. I'm not going to pronounce it, but the idea of only letting love in and only letting love out. I I, I appreciate that form. Um, having other folks who access protective crystals and. Folks who work with circles and uh, different forms of like cocoons, eggs, and spheres, uh, thank you for that. Oh, uh, one more note um, as uh, like to tack on the ends of talking about stones. Um, as a sort of generalized protection or ward against protection, something that establishes a boundary. Um, one of the other things that I've run into uh, that is especially prominent uh, in Wisconsin and also in uh, Minnesota that I've seen it is um, hex signs, which are geometric patterns that people, folks sometimes see on barns. Um, and hex signs are supposed to be generalized protective uh, uh, signs for barn, or, well, not, not just for barns, but for the farm itself in general um, to prevent bad circumstances from happening. And so that's also a, hey, we've placed this and it's going to keep out the bad things. Cool. So to uh, to move on to the next uh, set is uh, the concept. The next protective concept is the concept of sheltering, or at least this is what I'm going to call it, because it includes a wide variety of practices that do somewhat of a similar thing, which is that rather than making a barrier, 
that uh, keeps out something bad or a filter that keeps out something bad, what you are is creating a, um, a state of being or an environment that prevents bad circumstances. And uh, that might sound sort of confusing, but <clears throat> it includes a lot of uh, like, uh, it includes some different uh, practices. So uh, one thing is one might argue that um, having a uh, having sort of a good environment, either through smudging, um, uh, magical uh, daily magical practice, daily communion with uh, spirits or deities or uh, non-physical entities, um, creates an environment that uh, sort of washes away bad magic or bad energy or uh, bad circumstances. And so this is not necessarily a, a specific barrier that is uh, that is created to keep something out or to establish a specific space. What it's doing is it's sort of creating an environment um, that those things uh, can't last in. And um, I, I would argue that uh, one of that, that this sort of protection is actually the goal of a daily magical or occult practice in Western mysticism. Um, like doing something uh, simple such as a daily uh, grounding, centering, and shielding that we see in a lot of eclectic and Wiccan practices, or uh, doing something in like hermetic practices where you're doing uh, the lesser banishing of the pentagram and the middle pillar exercise, is uh, creating that environment uh, where good things bring in. Um, and so we also have, uh, th that practice is also analogous in some other traditions. In um, some Native American, and I I, I, I sigh and hesitate there because I, uh, the Native American practitioners that I talked to a long time ago uh, were not specific about their tribe. And I hate talking about uh, this without talking about tribe, but um, saging, smudging, or uh, burning incense um, is one way of creating a, a environment that where you've raised the vibration, you've increased the energy, or you have uh, created a space um, where positive things exist in. Hey, hex signs are also in Pennsylvania. Woo. <clears throat> um, so uh, it might be sort of interesting to talk about, but um, sheltering is also a really common magical practice um, as a part of uh, Christian mysticism is by saying, by cultivating a relationship with uh, some of the non-physical entities that are a part of uh, Christian uh, beliefs is one way and uh, creates this environment around you where bad circumstances cannot happen. It's not specifically a barrier. It's just that um, it, one of the things that having the greater presence of uh, God or a saint in your life uh, just sort of drives out bad things. And some of that can be accessed as part of uh, neo-pagan, pagan, and occult practices as well by saying that, hey, you have a relationship uh, with a non-physical entity, either a spirit, your ancestors, um, elementals, uh, a deity, or something like that what you got is that their presence, uh, their mere presence in sort of your energetic and astral environment um, at different points and times will drive out uh, bad circumstances that are happening around you. Um, sort of an interesting thing here and sort of also with an interesting story is that certain types of um, invisibility spells um, or in, uh, like magical operations that are supposed to make you non-perceptible um, can also be protection in this sort of way. They create an environment where bad circumstances can't find you. And so I'll share a particularly funny uh, 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 story that I had from uh, one of my teachers is that uh, a long time ago, back in the Halcyon days of the 90s, when I was learning about pagan stuff, um, so my the, the place where my teachers uh, were living uh, was effectively being harassed by a whole bunch of um, Christian religious solicitors. 
and they kept coming around and kept bothering people. And so what my teacher did at that uh, particular time was to craft an invisibility spell. I'm um, saying, hey, you know, like you can't find us, we're not here. And so this is one of those careful uh, what you wish for or be more specific about your intention um, because they crafted this invisibility spell in much too of a broad uh, circumstance. And the problem, for, the problem with it, and I was uh, interacting with them during this period in time was after they enacted this particular magical spell, uh, nobody could find them. Um, after that, uh, for about four days uh, afterwards, uh, they didn't have any mail delivered. Um, I wasn't able to uh, come over and visit them physically in person, and they couldn't get any deliveries of any other type uh, while this was uh, while this was happening, um, because uh, what uh, the mail people said and UPS said, hey, is we just we couldn't find your apartment. So. <clears throat> Um, sometimes you have to uh, like be a little specific about what sort of environment you are creating, lest you not uh, get some uh, unexciting side effects. Okay. So um, any questions, comments, or complaints on that one? I'm going to move into the next one because I still have a couple things to talk about. And we've got about... Uh, 23 minutes left. So the next magical uh, type of protection that I'm going to go into is something that I call counters. And counters are something that uh, takes harm and prevents it, or takes harm or bad circumstances and pre uh, prevents it from happening. And I kind of divide this into two uh, categories. Um, first are um, neutralizers. And so neutralizers are things that, like you're gonna have to bear with me because this is sort of an imprecise, uh, imprecise definition. Neutralizers are things that um, take and absorb negative energy, negativity, or bad circumstances into themselves and uh, prevent them from affecting uh, the person who's enacted them. So stuff about this are, um, Things like walkaway charms, which are charms that are created out of um, things like uh, lightning struck trees or pieces of metal from particularly bad accidents where people had survived, or, or things like that, which um, are supposed to prevent the similar bad circumstances from happening to you. <clears throat> um, also, uh, uh, in uh, to re-reference the 90s, hematite and hematite rings were particu particularly popular um, in the 90s and early 2000s as a way to absorb negativity and negative energy, um, at which point in time it was said that they would break, um, showing that uh, they had absorbed enough that they had to release some of that back, uh, presumably harmlessly, back into the environment. Another one that exists uh, in hoodoo is uh, the concept of a red salt bag, which is a, a bag made out of, a hand-stitched bag made out of red cloth, um, that contains a, a bent nail and uh, light and salt, which is supposed to uh, be carried on your person and will absorb negativity uh, as long as it exists, as long as the nail is unrusted. Additionally, uh, dream catchers also fall into this that are uh, sort of like uh, filters that attract um, bad energy and bad spirits and negative energy um, and prevent them from getting to you while you sleep. Um, also, witch bottles as a general category is generally um, the witch bottle itself is supposed to attract um, uh, negative energy and trap it inside of itself and confound that uh, the negative energy and the negative spells. Um, additionally, we have uh, stuff that I'm broadly talking about encounters uh, as uh, I guess I would call them counter spells, which is to say that um, neutralizers are things that exist because you, pardon me, don't necessarily know what's in your environment and you don't know what's coming at you. But counters in, um, are oftentimes uh, put into place when somebody knows that a bad circumstance could be coming down and com could be coming their way. And so a, a specific magical operation could be had to try to counter or avert a uh, magical 
a magical problem or a physical problem that you have had, but also there's some generalized counters. Uh, one of them is a planetary charity. <clears throat> and so planetary charity says that if you have a foreseeable bad thing that might be coming down the line, what you do is you uh, give charity um, in, or you give money to an organization that is associated with that planet's um, uh, like correspondences um, on the on the planetary day during the planetary hour, and that will bring the favor of the planet to you and counter some bad things that exist within your life. For example, is is if you had a if you knew that you had a particularly hard presentation that was coming up and where the odds were likely to be stacked against you, uh, you could give uh, uh, charity to an organization that helps foster communication um, on, the, on the day of Mercury and during the hour of Mercury in an amount of money uh, associated with Mercury's uh, magical number, um, depending on how that's viewed in your tradition. And that will bring the favor of Mercury to help sort of grease the skids and neutralize some of the bad effects of that bad circumstance. Um, Lucky Charms, um, in some extent, uh... <laughs> um, Lucky charms, in some extent, are, are also uh, a way of countering uh, bad things that happen um, because lucky charms in particular are supposed to make you more lucky or in one specific way or one specific uh, thing. They're not intended necessarily to absorb something bad, but to try and make things around you go better. So I put them as part of counters. Occasionally, some people also uh, put in this case divine intercession. I'm specifically ask, asking uh, divinities, elemental spirits, um, uh, or any of the, uh, the ancestors, the fae, uh, the land spirits, or something to help you specifically and act on your behalf in order to prevent bad stuff that you see coming down the way. Um, another active uh, way of addressing this is what are called uh, epitropic charms which are deal with um, specific cultural processes to try to avert bad circumstances. Some of this are like crossing your fingers or knocking on wood. I, uh, hey, look, here's a hairbrush. It's made of wood. Um, that um, if you foresee or a bad circumstance according to your culture comes around, um, that you can use the, utilize those charms to prevent the invocation of those bad experiences. Um, sometimes some uh, groups have protective mudras or hand signs, uh, protective chants, words, or different things. Um, one particularly popular one across cultures is the use of eye charms in order to prevent the evil eye. And the evil eye being a wide variety of different uh, things that can be uh, uh, different invokers of misfortune that can be in, uh, invoked intentionally or not intentionally by people. Oof. So there's a lot. Yeah, I'm sorry to I'm, I'm sorry to uh, reference uh, planetary charity without talking specifically about the days or the numbers. Um, those numbers do vary. So what you're going to want to do is you're going to want to look up a uh, a chart of planetary numbers and planetary days, and that'll uh, help you get you on your way. Also, planetary correspondences to talk about. Like what are the uh, what are the things? Oh, um, as another uh, aspect, um, I sometimes occasionally use planetary charity uh, dealing specifically with mer Mercury in order to deal with the effects of a Mercury retrograde. So. Um, and then lastly, there's a couple of oddballs that I didn't know where to exactly uh, characterize. Uh, one of them are uh, mirroring spells or return to sender spells, where you either know or suspect that there is some sort of negativity coming your way that was specifically sent your way by some sort of agent, um, either a, a non-physical entity or a physical entity, and you just want it to, uh, or sometimes you just have an inkling 
something that occurs to you that it might be and you want to send it back to its source. Um, so those, I call those mirror spells or return to, I've heard them also called return to sender spells. Um, so it's kind of an oddball because it's not exactly a, uh, it's not specifically a counter because it's not uh, specifically uh, neutralizing it, but it's not also exactly a shield. It's sort of like sending it back to where it came from. Um, sometimes also people like to include a category of spell that I call banishing blessings, whereby you attract the attention of whatever bad thing, and then the bad thing directs its attention uh, in a different direction. And so it just sort of like wanders off and it doesn't happen. Any questions, comments, or complaints uh, before I move on? Well, I will uh, I'll continue moving on just for the sake of time. OK, so let's get into uh, social magical protections. And um, this sort of falls into a weird category because um, we're talking about, in some sense, uh, how are people perceived? And the first one, which is pretty popular cross-culturally, um, is the idea of uh, posturing. And some might say, well, this just seems like a normal, ordinary thing where you're like, well, don't mess with me. And, um, and it drives off people. Well, this is a pretty classic thing cross-culturally um, from South Asia to Africa to, uh, to Europe to mainland Asia um, to South America uh, and Central America, whereas um, sorcerers and people who work with magic sorcerers, witches, and what have you, um, have, are known not to be trifled with. And um, oftentimes, uh, practitioners in different places actively cultivate uh, rumors that bad things happen to people that uh, mess with the witch or the sorcerer um, who lives in the area, so that you shouldn't mess with them. And this in itself is a type of magical protection, because it is uh, changing the consciousness of the people around you to say that, Really, only the people who um, uh, feel like their their concern is really worthy of your attention are going to deal with you, because uh, you uh, otherwise bad circumstances will fall onto people who uh, trifle with a magical practitioner's time. And some people think that this is very valuable. Some people think that this is something that uh, we shouldn't be cultivating. But it is something that. Uh, is cultivated cross-culturally or is known to uh, be a cross-cultural practice. Yeah, I forgot North America. Thanks, Laura. <laughs> um, and so uh, one last thing that I'm going to talk about uh, socially is a sort of one that is I, I don't want to spend too much time on. But I want to address it because some people consider it to be a part of magical practice. And um, that's the concept of binding. And uh, binding is sometimes considered to be a part of bane work or uh, work that uh, magical uh, practice that is intended to, uh, to bring harm or prevent harm by causing harm. And um, at, at Circle Sanctuary, we don't condone those types of practices broadly um, because we uh, embrace uh, ethical concepts related uh, to the threefold law and the idea of do no harm. Um, but I want to bring it up because it is a part of uh, pagan practice um, in different traditions. And so I, I don't think it's a, a good thing to just leave it out to say that it exists. But I'm not going to specifically be talking about uh, uh, types of being work or types of bindings. Uh, but the concept of binding as a protective practice is actively attempting to restrain the agency of somebody, either a physical person or non-physical person, to prevent them from causing bad circumstances. And um, that is a, uh, it's a magical operation that has a couple of problematic things, both from an ethical and a magical perspective. So I'm not going to address that uh, that further, but I wanted to bring it up because it's something that people do consider to be a part of pagan protective practices. And um, so I'm going to leave it at that. So the last group of uh, protective practices that I want to go into are uh, what I consider to be mental or philosophical protective practices. 
And um, those uh, um, are, instead of creating an energetic intention um, or using a charm or something to ward off uh, bad circumstances or to try and uh, change consciousness in uh, different places, um, the practitioner themselves are trying to change their own state of consciousness in order to bring about a, a, some sort of protective behavior in their own life. Mostly by shifting their perspective on the circumstances that are happening around them. Um, so the first, uh, the first type of mental practice is a practice of adaptability. And it's the idea that you want to cultivate within yourself a sort of outlook and philosophical viewpoint um, that drives your actions or a, a thing that you can, or a type of thought form that you can access that allows you to uh, um, adapt to bad circumstances and to meet them head on. Not necessarily that they're not going to harm you per se, or that the bad circumstances themselves cannot occur. But I would say a phrase that goes along with this is to say, um, I can figure it out. Um, the next one is resilience. Um, and the idea is, is that you're cultivating with yourself in yourself a mindset or a thought form that says that whatever the impact of bad circumstances um, it can, you can withstand it. And so one way to talk about that is the phrase, I can take it. Another way um, to look at a mental, uh, uh, like a mental protection is the idea of being pr of preparedness. Uh, to say that whatever comes your way, that you're ready for it or you're ready for anything, which is different than adaptability, which says that you might not know what's coming your way, but you can figure out what's going to happen. But in preparedness is that you are prepared for a variety of different circumstances um, that will come your way. The, um, the last one, I, I would call it an alchemical mindset, which is to say that um, the person, is, you're cultivating a thought form or a mindset that if a bad circumstance comes your way, you're looking for the good in it, or you're looking how to change the bad circumstance into a good circumstance. <clears throat> or to, let, let's say that you're trying to compost a bad circumstance and change it into something that is more beneficial for you. Okay, so those are the, um, those are the types of uh, different types of magical protections that I have come up with since starting to uh, con consider and think about this and conceptualize this festival and this festival stuff. And it's it's a lot. Like, I get you. I know that it's a lot. And we have very little uh, time left on this one. But are there any other questions, comments, or complaints before I wrap up and before we transition to the next uh, activity. Oh, um, before we go into this, I just wanted to, uh, because I, I didn't extend it, uh, I did a bunch of interviews with folks for the, uh, for the next pre-recorded uh, panel presentation, but I would like to thank all of the presenters that uh, agreed to talk with me, and I hope that uh, everybody enjoys it. Uh, thank you, Darlene. Um, yeah, that's a that's another philosophy that I think is uh, really closely associated with the um, alchemical philosophy, that which is, um, or uh, I would say that it also deals a lot with the Stoic philosophy, which is saying, hey, you know, you get to choose how you react to bad circumstances that happen. Well, 
thank you everybody for coming. Um, if you have any more questions, I will try and pay attention to the chat throughout the day and I might be able to answer some of them. Um, if not, if you uh, see me or see me on the uh, Facebook page, uh, feel free to ask me about some of the stuff that I uh, talked about today and I'll try and get you some uh, I'll try and get you some answers at least as well as I can understand them. Thanks. question, could you please uh, introduce yourself and say a bit about your tradition and your practice? Uh, my name is Laura Gonzalez. I am a priestess of the goddess from the Dianic tradition and I'm in, I am currently part of the minister's training program with Circle Sanctuary. 
I've been practicing eclectic Wicca for about 10 years. And I've been living my life through the philosophy of the Mexica Tenochka people, known as the Aztecs. I believe from birth, <laughs> you know, I'm a Mexican. So um, there's a lot of magic and a lot of uh, healing tradition that comes with it. And also intertwined with my formation and my practice is what I learned from my parents. My father being a new age practitioner when new age was new. Mm. And my mother being uh, a natural witch. I never heard her self-identify as a natural witch, but I observed that she was. Mm. So all of that, you put a nice ribbon on top of it, and that's what the Blue Witch does. <laughs> that's, that's Laura. Thank you. It's my pleasure to be here with you all. I'm Byron Ballard. I am Asheville, North Carolina's Village Witch. I'm an author. Um, an occasional blogger. Um, I practice a folk magic tradition, which is my magical practice, but my spiritual practice is goddess focused. I'm one of the founders of Mother Grove Goddess Temple, and I serve as the elder clergy person there, senior clergy, and I am um, a Wiccan high priestess. So I do a little bit of everything. And I'm a farmer and an herbalist. Sure. Uh, my name's Wade. I've been, uh, I guess I'd call it just a general pagan since 1992. I lean pretty heavily towards the, the heathen end of things and Northern European practices. I've been a tiersman uh, since 90, oh God, it's 97, um, in which uh, that is a kind of a henotheistic uh, focus on a singular God. So believing and honoring many gods, but uh, having a primary focus on one, which would be the Norse god Tyr of um, you know, the one hand and justice and all that good stuff. And uh, yeah, so I, I live at uh, Deeply Rooted, which is a pagan sanctuary up here in uh, Northwoods, Wisconsin, northwest of uh, Wausau, which is 160 acres of um, beautiful sacred land. I've been here for about 20 years. And uh, I also do prison ministry for the last 17 years. Well, not with this COVID silliness going on, but uh, uh, but uh, getting back to that as soon as possible. And uh, so, yeah, so I live a lot of my life within the pagan heathen world. And uh, so, yeah. That's pretty much where I'm at. Could you describe to us um, how your tradition or your practice sees protection as a concept and a practice? I believe that everything begins with the mind and the intention. So I naturally believe that we need to be protected at all times and I think that protection comes from the from your devotion, from your devotional practice, your daily practice, and um, also from actively having faith and living every day through your faith, um, knowing that the divine is always with you. In this case, I refer to the divine as the goddess. So uh, knowing that goddess is with me all the time and being thankful for me um, in my very personal practice, I am a devotee of Goddess Fortuna. So uh, my personal experience is uh, to, to receive the favor of Fortuna, you have to put in gratitude. So I'm a person that believes in gratitude as a means of protection, you know. Thankful for all the things that go well and thankful for the things that might not be going so well, but they will they will turn like the wheel of fortune that continuously will be turning. Um, and I think one has to be not fearful all the time. It's, it's a very different concept to be afraid all the time and needing to be protected all the time because you're afraid that something is going to happen as opposed to being cautious, you know, taking the precautions to be safe and there you go, you know, finding a life that is going to be lived uh, well protected and in harmony with the universe and the divine. I think probably as most other people, I'm going to say I speak for myself and not necessarily for my tradition, though there will be a, co a lot of commonalities between what I say and what other people believe. That's the caveat we almost always have to put before any comment these days, isn't it? I, in no way do I speak for all of my people or the people with whom um, I associate. <laughs> um, 
protection? Well, we believe that protection is a necessity. I know there are some some people who feel like they they just let the universe happen as it is going to happen and they sort of roll with the punches and they practice more resilience than protection. But I have always been a belt and suspenders kind of person, both with my magical practice and my spiritual practice. So the idea that you could know that something is coming towards you, whatever that is, either physical or metaphysical, um, then and gives yourself it will give you a chance to set up some protections both physical and metaphysical in the in the processes that we call warding shielding um, mine always goes first directly to grounding because i am in all things an animist and that connection that deep connection to the planet affords us so much that when we skimp on that step we end up many times feeling even more out of balance than we did before, if that makes sense. So do you, does, did that answer that enough or would you like a little bit more? I think that's good. Okay. So uh, my next question is, um, what sort of issues require you to do protective work? All sorts of issues. Um, the, the world is filled with energies. And as I say in some of my classes, the thing about energy that we sometimes forget and we really need to remember is that if you use energy in the morning to put bread in the toaster oven, it will toast your bread. But if you stick a fork in a light socket, it will toast your butt. So the idea that there are energies that are moving constantly through the world that we live in should give us pause about how we not only perceive those energies, but utilize those energies if we choose to do that, or protect ourselves from them if we choose to do that. We so often in my world, people will send me um, a message of some sort saying, they know so-and-so must have put a hex on them because suddenly their life is not going very well. And I, I sometimes laugh to myself because there are so few people who could actually do that. And most of the people who can actually do that level of Bane work are really not concerned at all with that sort of, with that sort of tit for tat stuff. So there are many instances where doing that sort of protection are called for. It may be that you are going into a difficult situation and you want to have all of your resources, both your intellectual and emotional resources, focused in and to put protective wards around your car or your house and then shield yourself from extra energies is so important to be able to achieve the sort of focus that really sets our intentions into motion. So that is an instance. Obviously, if you feel that someone has um, bad intentions towards you, you're going to want to get your shields up and set some wards. But in addition to that, it doesn't, it doesn't hurt us at all if we are in a place where we are now. And as you know, I refer to the place we are in our cultural collapse as tower time. And if we are in this place where there is a lot of general chaotic energy flowing around that isn't necessarily directed at us personally, it's a wonderful opportunity to practice the sort of shielding that will keep that at bay while you go ahead to do the work that you are called to do. Well, for heathen and uh, Northern European and like the whole Asatru, Odinism as a big general concept, tends to take uh, protection uh, a little more pragmatically and a little more physically in yeah. which uh, Protection is the idea, it's a kind of a constant state. It's not something that you you do when needed. It's something that you always have, you're always engaged in. So there's a pretty solid emphasis on uh, like physical capacity, physical fitness, physical you know vitality, and so that you are always ready to deal with any problems that might come up. And so when they do come up, you're, you're just kind of like automatically ready. You have that mindset that um, 
and again, historically, the, the, the Northern European place was a pretty uh, eh, dangerous place for everybody. So you constantly had to have your armor and your shield up and be ready for some animal or some person to try to kill you at any given moment. And uh, so that kind of has more of the, the mental aspect of it, that you are always in a um, an in, kind of an intentionally uh, ready state. Uh, there's the, the rune Thurisaz, which is uh, kind of just the, the line with the, the kind of triangle in the front with, uh, that represents the spiked shield, and it's called sometimes the thorn or the active defense, in which you always have the ability to do something about any problem that might come up, and therefore you don't really worry that much about things you need protection from, because you can take it, and you are ready to take it on. What sort of issues require you to do protective work? I believe that in this day and age, it comes from going to the street, going to the uh, corner store, you know, if you, if you want to be protected, if you want to be safe, uh, especially for folks that live in big cities like myself or other people that, you know, is also New York or California or what have you, um, to be safe, to be protected. In this case, you know, we live in the COVID times, so, you know, to be protected, uh, to be healthy, et cetera. Uh, but also in general, you know, you never know when when your time is up and uh, you always want to be protected and you want to be in harmony with the universe. So in general, as I was saying earlier, you know, your your daily devotion will be a means of protection. But if you are also, we are very sensitive people, you know, the, us, the people that are trying to reconnect or trying to have our religion live through nature and the nature cycles, we're very sensitive to energy and we're very sensitive to um, what I always tell people might be uh, unintentional uh, people clinging to your energy or depleting that energy that you exude uh, or in layman terms, you know, sometimes envy or jealousy or, you know, um, even sometimes our own insecurities can cause this type of situations. And I think that one has to be proactive to protect themselves when one feels that they need extra protection. Hmm. And that will go beyond the daily practice if you have one, or if you don't have a daily practice, then um, to be very focused and, and minded about, okay, I'm going to do this ritual, or I'm going to do this chant, or I'm going to do this wash, or I'm going to cleanse my house, or I'm going to smoke a little bit, uh, of incense or whatever with the focus and the intention of changing the energies and then bring about protection um, and there are various numbers of techniques of course that people utilize and uh, yeah I think it's the main thing is to trust your intuition and if you feel that you need a little extra protection then go for it all sorts of issues um, the, the world is filled with energies. And as I say in some of my classes, the thing about energy that we sometimes forget and we really need to remember is that if you use energy in the morning to put bread in the toaster oven, it will toast your bread. But if you stick a fork in a light socket, it will toast your butt. So the idea that there are energies that are moving constantly through the world that we live in should give us pause about how we not only perceive those energies, but utilize those energies if we choose to do that, or protect ourselves from them if we choose to do that. We So often in my world, people will send me um, a message of some sort saying, they know so-and-so must have put a hex on them because suddenly their life is not going very well. And I, I sometimes laugh to myself because there are so few people who could actually do that. And most of the people who can actually do that level of Bane work are really not concerned at all with that sort of, with that sort of tit for tat stuff. So there are many instances where doing that sort of protection are called for. It may be that you are going into a difficult situation and you want to have all of your 
resources, both your intellectual and emotional resources focused in and to put protective wards around your car or your house and then shield yourself from extra energies is so important to be able to achieve the sort of focus that really sets our intentions into motion. So that is an instance. Obviously, if you feel that someone has um, bad intentions towards you, you're going to want to get your shields up and set some wards. But in addition to that, it doesn't, it doesn't hurt us at all if we are in a place where we are now. And as you know, I refer to the place we are in our cultural collapse as tower time. And if we are in this place where there is a lot of general chaotic energy flowing around that isn't necessarily directed at us personally, it's a wonderful opportunity to practice the sort of shielding that will keep that at bay while you go ahead to do the work that you are called to do. Um, again, for the Northern European tradition, it, there was uh, definitely some focus on, on the idea of uh, the necessary things for spiritual protection. Uh, but again, the primary 99% focus was on the practicals, on the physical. So the idea of um, that you really weren't that worried about, you know, ghosts or spirits or negative energies or, you know, people coming to, you know, sap your energy. You were worried about, you know, walruses eating you or your neighbor trying to stab you for your food. I'm being extraordinarily facetious there, of course. But uh, that you, your, your preparedness, your, your mentality was, was very physical based. And so the idea of having a weapon on you, an actual physical weapon was a very common practice. And uh, in the modern world, I know most heathens are, are pro Second Amendment, pro gun, pro sword, pro crossbow, pro pro any kind of weapon you can imagine. And uh, I think what that does is that when you have that that physical capacity to defend and protect yourself, it, it bleeds over automatically into the mental and to the spiritual. That uh, if you if you know you can take care of yourself physically in any situation, it's very easy to then be able to spiritually take care of yourself. And in many of the again in the northern traditions, you don't um, you don't shy away from conflict or, or battle or even death. These things are a, a part of the, the natural cycle and can be a, a glorious good thing actually. And so you don't you wouldn't shy away from conflict or or aggression next necessarily. You wouldn't seek it out, but when it showed up, you wouldn't be necessarily unhappy about it. And this kind of again leads to that general mentality that you are you're always armed in a physical spiritual mental way for whatever comes into your path and so when specific things happen like a a, a, a physical aggressor you're ready for that when you come to a situation where there's a, a stress or a worry or a, um about something like that that comes up at, at work or with your family you're already in that mindset of how to physically protect yourself from any harm that's coming your way and then spiritually Again, you are hopefully in, in a situation where you are walking well with, with the, the sacred, with the gods, with the ancestors, with the things you find sacred. And if there is a problem, you, you can automatically call upon them. They're, they're, they're always there. They're always ready to assist you. They're not going to do the work for you. They're not going to protect you just for your own sake. But if you've proven yourself worthy, if you put the effort and the energy into it, then they will be there when needed, regardless of what the situation is. Um, so to follow up on that, that uh, bridges very nicely into my next question, which is uh, what sort of protective work do you do day to day? I do, and going back to my father, and this might sound paradoxical for people that work a lot with intention and mantras and um, the power of the, of the word, because one of the laws of uh, magic is never, never speak about what you don't want, right? So... Um, instead of saying this doesn't hurt, the mantra should be this is pleasant, right? Or this feels good. However, this is something that I learned from my father when I was like probably six or seven years old. And it's a mantra that I go to all the time. And it obviously rolls off the tongue in Spanish and in English it's a little bit more complicated. Um, so I'm going to give you both versions. Uh, un halo magnético me protege y nada ni nadie me puede hacer daño, which means a magnetic halo protects me, nothing and no one can hurt me. Mm. 
And so by the modern standards of magic from people that I learned, uh, you know, on, on all these years of practice, mm -hmm. oh, you shouldn't talk about nothing and no one can hurt me because you're acknowledging that there's hurt. However, this has been something that has been with me since I was a child. And it has just become my very personal protection, mantra, spell, practice, etc. So uh, what I do, and this is where we're going to get to practice and get to do things. I visualize, which is just a fancy word for imagine. I just visualize myself in a cocoon or inside of a ring or inside of a circle. And it is an impenetrable circle. And that circle irradiates just good and positive energy uh, to the, towards the outside. And inside of it, I am seeing myself doing what to me is one of the most sacred symbols, which is a pentacle. Mm -hmm. And I will be doing the pentacle um, 12 times around, kind of like the clock. And every time I do a pentacle, I repeat the mantra, you know, a magnetic halo protects me and no one and nothing can hurt me. And I try to do that every night. Sometimes I don't do it, again, with the daily devotional. However, if I am nervous, if I am in a train and someone is looking at me funny or uh, in this day and age where we cannot escape racism, misogyny, and all these other things, and as a person of color myself, you know, sometimes you can feel that the energy of the people that they're looking at you is not necessarily friendly. Uh, so I just go in my head and I start, you know, repeating a magnetic halo protects me and no one and nothing can hurt me. And I just try to be right here, right now, repeating that mantra. Um, a nice exercise of, of seeing that as a ring. And what I have shared with, with some of my uh, students and classmates here in Chicago is if you have a ring, for example, um, you can charm that ring or you can chant the mantra over the ring or a belt or a necklace. And if you have a necklace while you are repeating that mantra in your mind, uh, the power of the mind, of course, it helps you connect with the ring and kind of like activate and it's like a reset button and you activate that energy and you just like naturally create that shield between you and the outside world. Think about that circle that you do when you're doing ritual with your with your coven mates, with your witchy friends, or at circle with, with the community. And that circle is created to protect us all and to have the uh, practice and the workings of magic. Well, you're, doing, you're, you're bringing that energy with it, but uh, you activate it when you physically touch the ring or touch the necklace. Or if it's a belt, you're touching the belt and, you know, like kind of like bringing that um, state of mind into the physicality of your world, something that you can touch and then connecting with it and then expanding that energy. Um, and a, a curious and funny note for whoever wants to hear this is the first time I did this exercise, imagining the bubble, my bubble became a disco ball. Out of all things, so I'm inside of the disco ball, uh, repeating the mantra and dancing. And because it's, there are mirrors outside, but it's a curved image. So some practitioners, I've heard that they want to return the harm to the person that is sending or to the thing or the situation that could be sending that energy towards you. But if you have a mirror that is slightly angled, that energy will bounce off and go elsewhere, right? So it's not an eye for an eye, but rather, no thank you, I don't want your energy, let me just send it out elsewhere. The great goddess will transform it into something positive. Mm, I don't know that there's anything that I do on a daily basis. Uh, except for grounding and and I am lucky grounding has always been easy for me I don't know if it's because I've lived in this area I live in the southern highlands of Appalachia I've lived here 
almost all of my life. I went away to school. I lived in London for a little while, but mostly I've been here. And not only that, but generationally, my family has been here. They've been in Western North Carolina and the area immediately around that since the late 1600s, early 1700s. So grounding feels just like the touching base with the biosphere that I do on a regular basis because I'm a, a native of this place. I am indigenous in that way, but also because I'm an animist. So I want to be, I want to be touching all those extra spirit beings around me. So I, I'm, I ground often, but I, I teach a protocol for shielding um, that I encourage people to do anytime they're starting to feel wobbly. And it involves, I call it the jewel case in front of me from the earth. I pull a wall of emerald on my right, a wall of diamond behind me is ruby. And over to my right is, of course, amethyst. And so it forms this circle around me that then scoops down in a bowl under my feet and above me in a dome so that I'm completely surrounded. And I have found that sometimes the energy is the chaotic energy of the world moving, of the seasons changing, of the cars that are going back, back and forth on the road. Sometimes it's a matter of, I drank way too much black tea today, and I just feel like a jittery, crazy woman. And so if I can get my shields up fast, I can go, you know what? You need to drink a couple of glasses of water, do some deep breathing, you're gonna be okay. And then on the, for me, fortunately, I'm knocking on wood. The, on the rare occasion that I feel that that is personally directed, I wanna make sure I get my shields up fast and then I might want to mirror those shields and send back whatever is coming in my direction. That way I don't have to stop and consider who might be sending it, but just that whatever that is, I'm gonna send it back. And then if it's nothing at all, it's the fact that there was a 4.7 Richter earthquake 100 miles away, and that's what I'm feeling. Nobody gets hurt. I just send the energy back and send it away. But if it's something that's pointed directly at me, I just do this little return to sender spell and send it back that from the place it came, and then I don't have to think about it. Well, uh, physically, I, I try my best to keep myself physically fit and ready to take care of that sort of thing. Um, mentally, the idea of just being situated aware, like knowing where things are, like you walk into a room knowing you know, what, the, what it feels like, where the people are, what's the mood of the place, what's actually going on, always being engaged and aware of your environment, and you can then kind of cut any problems off ahead of time. Uh, there is a, one thing, though, because working in the prisons, you definitely deal with uh, a different level of people on a regular basis, and the normal kind of protection that, I, that I'd be doing of just, you know, being aware, being focused, having that, that shield up in uh, one of the places I was going into wasn't working. And uh, it, it was just, I'd come away from it drained, angry, just uh, contaminated, I guess would be the best way to put it. And so whatever protections I had up weren't working. And so I researched a bit and I found this really obscure concept in Northern European tradition called the Varlog or the Vorlog, which um, if you ever seen the movie 13th Warrior, there's the point where there's the, the, sh there's the, the kid that's on the boat and he's just standing there on the boat and the guy says, well, what is he doing? He said, well, he's letting people see him. It's like, well, everyone can see him. What's the problem? They said, well, that might not be him. That might be something out of that myth, of the mist that might be his Varlog. And it's this belief that when you send, when you think about something or you're sending yourself forward, like you gotta, you're gotta, you really looking forward to an event or something, part of you has already gone forward, is already there. And in some traditions, I believe it manifests as the Varlog, as an aspect of yourself cast forward. So moving on that idea, I figured out the system in which casting the Varlog, casting the aspect of yourself forward, but not in space or in time, just a millimeter above your skin. So there's you, and then overlapped is the cast forward Varlog aspect of yourself. And so then you concentrate on that, and you just push yourself forward that little bit, and then you go into these circumstances, which may not be the greatest as far as energy or spiritual stuff, 
and the negative stuff attaches to that. And then I just learned that when I left the institution, I would then just kind of slough off the, the var log that projected sense of self and all the stuff that was attached with it went with it as well. And so then I had no problems, no issues of being drained or attacked or, or stuff after that. Um, but yeah, for me, that, that's what been, been one of the biggest things. The other thing is uh, with rune work, again, using the rune thurisaws as, uh, as just kind of in visualizing that as, as the shield with, with the spike or the point on the, or the, the boss on the front of it that you always have with you on a kind of a spiritual nature. And it's always there that if you need to, it comes up and it can push back and fight back against what you've got around you. And just having that, that visualization, that, that option, always to be able to bring up that shield at any time just really kind of gives a peace of mind. And, and for me, that, that's what's kind of worked over the years. Could you tell us about a situation that might require protective work uh, that goes beyond what you would do day to day? I believe precisely if you're doing work in group, if you are like myself, I fancy myself as a witch for hire. I do tarot readings, I do healings, I work with the public a lot. I put myself out there with, with the podcast and et cetera. So I'm constantly out in the in the uh, eye, in the public eye. Uh, but say you're gonna conduct a ritual for Samhain or you are going to, or you're gonna go to do something, I don't know, um, to a, a government office. You need to go fill out a form or whatever and you feel that there is a need for an extra layer of protection. Um, whether it is for magic or for something that could be seen as dangerous or something that creates anxiety for you. You know, if you have, in this day and age, if you have to go to the doctor and if you have to step foot in a hospital, that might give you anxiety. So you know what? You put your ring, you put a little layer of extra protection. And if you like the mantra that I just shared with you and you've been practicing with that, and if you charm your ring or your um, necklace or your belt, but you need some extra protection, then do a circle at home and, and cast a circle. And uh, I don't know, put a mirror in there to reflect yourself as protected and then go do your thing or put an extra candle or call into the ancestors and the divine as you understand that on your tradition there is no such a thing as too much protection. So anything and everything that makes you feel safe, your faith should provide with you feeling safe. So whatever it is, in a personal note, I have a tiny, tiny, tiny little doll that is like a worry doll. And Whenever I feel that I need that extra, extra protection, I bring her with me. I might put it on my pocket or I might stuck it under my shirt or, or I will keep it on my hand. You know, if, if it's something like if you're just going in and out, uh, say to the doctor's office or whatever, just keep it on your hand, you know, and, you know, like uh, inc inconspicuously, I don't know the word, in secretly, yeah. keep it by you. And, um, there is no such thing as too much protection. I, I think the bottom line is that. So, you know, whatever you need to do. Um, there are herbs and there are crystals that are very good for protection. I usually go to um, frankincense, incense. I will use, I myself, because I like the vibration of obsidian, I will carry an extra piece of obsidian. Uh, the possibilities are endless. And I think for each tradition or each person, the practice, whatever makes sense to them, to bring about the protection and to heighten that vibration. And, you know, if you have a crystal in your pocket, you just rub that crystal and while you need to speak with the person or some people, uh, when they do public speech, they feel very, very anxious. So, you know, just grab a lapis lazuli and rub it on your pocket or, you know, if you have a, a I like jewelry charms a lot. So, you know, if you have like a, 
like a bracelet and you know just play with a bracelet you know like oh like it's just the thing you're doing people don't know where you're doing i'm gonna go back a few years and some of the people hearing this will remember there was a there was an a right-wing christian group that was praying for the nation state by state and they were directing these very um harmful sounding prayers so they weren't they weren't praying for the peace and love of each state they were they were praying for the militant intervention of their particular god into the operations of each state and this was maybe i don't know seven or eight years ago so that felt to me like an opportunity not only for me to do some work but to connect with magic workers and energy workers all over the state of North Carolina to create this protective web around the state. And we did that and we did it with our neighboring states too. So we did it with Virginia, South Carolina, Georgia, Tennessee, West Virginia and Kentucky. Mm -hmm. And we would create these webs of energy that were we thought of them as trampolines mm -hmm. so that as that prayerful, but not prayerful in a, in, a, in a gentle and beautiful sense. But when that came flowing towards us, we wanted to be able to bounce it back and off. And so that was a, a, a time when we energetically, each of us would set our own personal shields. And then we would set wards around wherever we were working. And then together we created this enormous ward state by state around each of those places where we felt we were threatened. And it was a wonderful opportunity for like-minded people to work towards a particular goal, which we sometimes don't have in kind of a larger sense like that. But it also gave us a chance to kind of flex our muscles a little bit, which is really good for us. I encourage people all the time because I'm a folk magician to really practice magic a lot and not wait until there's an emergency because at that point you're going to be too possibly freaked out or too involved to really be able to maybe bring your a game so the more you practice it's with anything if you are a piano player the more you practice the better you're going to get and the same thing is true with setting wards with personal shielding, with grounding, all of that. The more you practice, the better you get. And you can do it all the time. You No, I don't ever recommend that somebody get their shields up and keep them up all the time. That's madness. It would, it would take an incredible amount of energy to do that. But to discern when it is necessary to get your shields up fast. And I tell people, it's just like Star Trek. Shields up, shields up. So it can't be this lovely languid meditation in which I raise a wall of emerald and a wall of diamond. It has to be, bam, my shields are up. I am grounded, my shields are up, what is going on? And when you practice that, you can practice it anywhere, anytime. If you're driving down the road and you're stuck at that red light that every time, every town has one particular traffic light that seems to go on for 10 minutes. If you are stuck at that traffic light, Practice your grounding and shielding. Just practice it. Doesn't hurt you. Keeps you from having road rage. I'm just going to practice my shielding. It's going to be fine. And I always, when I teach shielding, I teach it that you should, you should bring your shields up on a Kegel exercise. And that's a, an exercise for your pelvic floor. So you do one, two, three Kegels, and then your shields are up. It's lovely. And plus you did a Kegel exercise. And every woman listening to this right now just did a Kegel exercise. And some of the men did too, because we all want a strong pelvic floor. That's part of our protective practice. I mean, there's definitely like extraordinary circumstances. Like if you put yourself in a you know, bad part of town at two in the morning kind of thing. But in general, the idea of the, the preparedness, the, the, the mental day-to-day -day practice of being ready, of being um, focused on your environment, of being in tune on what's changing, what's happening around you, kind of allows you to get around and to negate that stuff before it actually gets to a bad space. Uh, it's like um, a couple times if you're around a campfire and, and uh, again, Northern European folk tend to drink a lot and uh, 
you can notice that you, you know the person that's drinking too much. And if you're paying attention, and if you're one of the sober ones, you see where that's going towards a bad situation. You, you, you know that that's just a general, if you're focused, you're paying attention, you can see that going in a bad direction. And instead of having to wait until someone throws a punch and you got to physically protect yourself or take a knife off of somebody, if you can then take care of that ahead of time and realize that the person's a, I mean, a problem, the energy is moving in a bad, bad direction ahead of time, you can then cut off that, that problem for more extreme need for protection. Um, on, on a totally different note, uh, living out on the land, we, we have um, the fey folk or the land vites here, whatever you want to call them, that are, some are very helpful and, and joyful and, and pleasant, some are not. And uh, having a consistent relationship with them, I don't know if that kind of qualifies as protection, but it does protect you from bad, weird stuff happening in which you regularly leave offerings, you have a consistent relationship, in which if they take something or something bad starts happening, you kind of know who you need to give an extra offering to or negotiate an extra interaction with. And that's just more about, I guess, maintaining relationships with, with the faith folk or the unseen folk and the land itself. Um, and that, I wish there was some sort of a way to, to, to tell people to do it the right way every time, but it is so hit or miss or random. I, I don't think there's any way you can actually learn or teach that. You just kind of got to, go and figure out what works on the way. Do you have anything you want to tell us about? Do you have any new projects that you that you want to share? Sure. I, uh, as always, to invite everybody, of course, I had to put my commercial out there to listen to CSMP, listen to the Circle Sanctuary Network podcast. We have, of course, uh, Selena Fox's two shows, on Sunday and Wednesday, we have Circle Talk, we have Moon Magic, and we have Yours Truly with Lunatic Mondays, Lunas Lunaticos, and then the wonderful team of Paganos del Mundo offering podcasts on Spanish and Portuguese. And also, um, I'm going to be doing presentations online this year. I will be doing So Far, uh, Witch Fest North. Um, that is going to be online because of his reasons. And because of that, I actually got invited. So I will be presenting on October 9th. I will be doing my Day of the Dead uh, slash Native Traditions um, uh, presentation. And I know a lot of people probably have seen me or heard me on the podcast do the Day of the Dead thing, but I promise you every time is different. Uh, for A, sometimes I forget things and then I just say them on the next time. And B, this is such an evolving and living tradition that every time we do uh, talk about the other dead, there's something new, you know. And, uh, and I also have done some uh, Spanish collaborations for um, the fall equinox celebration and the dark goddesses and those will be available uh, on pre-recording, so for people who speak Spanish, they can uh, check on those. And then I'm also welcome to whatever comes. You know, I will be letting you all know. I'm picking a lot of green beans in my garden, which is really, really important because they're delicious. But my my big projects are um, I'm doing a podcast with a friend of mine called Weird Mountain Gals, W Y R D, and it's all about Appalachian folk culture. I have a book coming out in February from Llewellyn mm -hmm. called Roots, Branches, and Spirits, which is about Appalachian folk magic. I have a book coming out um, tentatively titled Seasons of a Pagan Life coming out from Wiser in late spring of mm -hmm. next year. And that's a book on following the wheel of the year and deepening your spiritual practice through animistic practices. Mm -hmm. And I'm writing a cookbook. Uh -huh. Yeah, and um, and learning some Italian. So yeah, I'm uh, keeping busy in COVID, and I know everybody else is too. And and just holding holding on to how we walk through the next couple of months till we get through the election, and then sort of discern or suss out what what happens next. <laughs> always doing stuff. Um, 
actually two projects. The Pagan Homeland Foundation is a big one that I'm working on right now in which uh, trying to get uh, – Deeper Red, it's awesome. It's great to have people up there, but we don't want 50,000 pagans camping out on our land. Uh, so the idea of having – we need to have more space, more physical places for pagan folk across the country. So the, day, the idea of the Pagan Homeland Foundation is to get funds together and to help small groups – uh, incorporate and become 501c3 organizations and then apply for grants. They can then purchase buildings and land that can be part of the pagan the pagan homeland where we can do and congregate and do pagan stuff. Uh, like right now, I'm actually, after I'm done here, I'm driving down to Colby, Wisconsin, where there's a church for sale. Uh, Colby's kind of in the middle of nowhere, but it'd be kind of nice to, to buy up the old churches that are going up for sale and turn them into pagan temples. Uh, the other part project I'm working on is uh, the Pagan Resource Guide in which I uh, just got this really nice interactive map of Wisconsin. And we're trying to get all the groups and organizations to um, just put a little little tab on there so people can know where things are and where to plug in. So many times people are trying to look for pagans and they just don't know. Or if you don't find them online, you're, you're out of luck. And so we're doing that. Um, both those are, are through Deeply Rooted at the moment. So deeply-rooted.org uh, or Wade M on Facebook, Pagan Homeland Foundation on Facebook. Deeply Rooted Church on Facebook, or uh, give me a call, 715-574-5288. Happy to help with any sort of pagan stuff going on out there.
Hey everyone, my name is Hollis and I am here to talk to you about familiars. So familiars are like animal friends, they're partners and companions. And the name familiar means an animal that you are really close to and you like a lot. And sometimes this can be used to talk about wild animals like dolphins or kangaroos or bears, animals that people really like a lot. I really like crows, and so I consider crows to be a kind of familiar for me. But the kind of familiar we're talking about today are pets. So the kind of familiars that live with you and are always around and kind of your best buddy. So cats, dogs, ferrets, birds, frogs, snakes, all of these really cute um, critters that live in your house with you. Um, familiars can do a bunch of different things. So sometimes familiars protect you. Uh, we see familiars that are protective like dogs. Um, and this is kind of something that everybody knows about dogs. Dogs really love their owners and they want to be there for them and they want to help them out and they want to make sure that they stay safe. Uh, some other familiars can teach you things. Like you might learn from a cat how to be relaxed and how to kind of hang out and not get scared by different things. Um, you can learn how to walk around in the dark without tripping and falling. Um, and then sometimes uh, familiars know when you're doing magic. So, for example, my cat really likes to be around when I'm doing spells, but also knows when to stay away and kind of off to the side when there's a spell where if he is right in the middle of it with me, he might get in the way. So, I'll introduce you to my familiar really quick, and then we are going to make familiars out of origami, um, which is folding paper. And this way, if you don't have a pet of your own or a familiar of your own at your house, you can have one and maybe they can, and having it around can kind of help you remember things, kind of help teach you things. And then if you have any questions about things and you're thinking about them and you're kind of by yourself, you can maybe ask yourself what your origami familiar might do to help you solve the problem. So first off though, let's meet my familiar, Susu. This is Susu, my familiar. He doesn't always like being held, so we're not going to hold him right now. He is looking out the window, really, really excited to see some birds today. But I got him from a shelter about a year ago, and he and I are the best of friends, and he sleeps on the foot of my bed, and he likes to watch me when I'm doing spells, and he's just a really great familiar to have. Isn't that right, sweetie? Oh yeah, he's having a good time with birds right now. So let's leave him alone um, and let him do his thing watching the birds outside. And let's start talking about so watch me when I'm All doing right. spells. So we're on to and he's just a really great familiar. familiar. So we're going to make right each origami familiar, like I said, two times. So the first one we're going to make is a dog. So we are going to make an origami dog. I have a big piece of paper. Um, and this piece of paper is not an origami paper, so it doesn't have a white side or a, and a colored side. It's the same color on both sides, so that way you can follow along with just regular colored paper instead of origami paper. So, the first thing that we're going to do to make our origami dog is we are going to fold the paper diagonally. So we're going to fold it so that way the opposite corners are touching. Okay, and what you want to do when you're folding this is you want to take your finger and you want to run it along the crease so that way the crease is nice and neat. And you can even see here, creases don't have to be perfect. There can be a little, there can be a little bit on the end. So don't worry if it's not perfectly done. Okay, so you made it a new triangle. And then you're going to open it up and lay it flat again. And you can kind of see there's a crease in the paper. And then we're going to fold it the opposite way. Okay? So we're going to fold it corner to corner again, but we're going to go the other way. 
we're going to lay it flat and we're going to run our fingers along the crease again. And again, this paper isn't a perfect square. So there's a little bit hanging over the sides here like it before, but don't worry about it. So we're going to open the piece of paper up. And now you should have a piece of paper that looks like this where it's got a big X in the middle. So now after we do that and you've got your piece of paper with the X in the middle, we're going to take all of the corners of the piece of paper and we're going to fold them into the middle. So you take the corner and you're going to put it right here in the middle of the X. And you're going to fold that and again you want to take your finger and you want to run it along the edge so that way it's nice and flat. And you're gonna do that with all four sides. You're gonna fold it into the middle. Do, 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 do. Now, while you're doing this, think of why you would want a dog for an origami familiar. So, what kind of qualities does a dog have that would make you want to have a dog around? So, dogs are really loyal. Um, listening to your dog familiar might help you be a better friend. So if you want to be a better friend, sometimes watching a dog and seeing what dogs do can kind of help you figure out what to do with your friends. Uh, now we've got all of our little corners here in the middle. So you folded all of them up. So all of them in the middle here. So now we've got what looks like a smaller square right here in the middle. All right. So next, after we fold all of our pieces in the middle here, we're going to take one of the pieces, let's take this piece. We're going to take this piece, so you're gonna take your left hand and you're gonna fold this piece out. And you're just going to have it so that way it's out. And then you're gonna take the point and where the edge of the paper is right here, you are going to fold the tip of the point here into the center of that little X. So that way it meets the edge of the paper. So then it's gonna look like this, okay? So there's going to be a little X in the middle there and you're going to put the point there. All right, and then you're gonna fold that back in so that way it kind of looks like the point is gone. So that way it kind of looks like this when you're looking at it. So then we're going to take out this point here. Okay. And we're going to take this point here and we're actually going to um, put it so that way the point is pointed backwards. So now we're taking this point and we're kind of folding it, not quite just to the edge, but we want to fold it a little bit over the edge. So that way it kind of looks like this. And you kind of want to fold it like that. You want to run your finger along the crease like before. So now if you're looking at your piece of paper, it's going to look like that, okay? So now, got the piece of paper kind of looking like this. And then you're gonna fold the piece of paper and you're gonna fold it in half. You're gonna take that, you're just gonna bend it and there should be a crease here already so you don't have to worry about uh, bending it again. You're gonna fold your piece of paper in half and you're gonna lay it flat. You wanna run your hands over it, make sure all the creases are tight and tiny. And oh, what's, what's that here? What's that? I think it's, I think it's your little dog's tail. And it's wagon, so you're already halfway there. You're doing a really good job, okay? So then this is the hard part. So now you have a piece of paper and it's gonna look like this. And you've got your little dog tail crease. You wanna make sure that this is a crease here. And then there's this little underside here. And then you're going to fold in flat. And you're going to take the inside here and you're gonna pull out this little flap, okay? You're gonna pull that out and kind of lay it flat. And then you're going to take the paper here and you're gonna kind of make a crease along right here. 
So you're going to pull this back and you're going to make a crease along the top corner and the bottom corner. So you're kind of going diagonal across this rectangle. And then you're gonna fold that backward. And you're going to push it down and you're gonna kind of crease it and fold that back. So that way that's creased. And then you're going to take Oh, my crease is a little off. Let's see if I can fix that. When you fold it back, you should be able to go all the way to the edge of the rectangle. So my crease is a little messed up, but that's okay. Mistakes happen. And then you're going to fold this back, and then you should have kind of a triangle here. So that way it's going to look like this. Okay, so your triangle is going to fit right along the edge of this rectangle and you're going to have this weird looking thing right here. And you're probably going to wonder, what is this? It doesn't look like a dog anymore. Don't worry. We're going to do the same thing to the other side. And hopefully this time I won't mess up the crease too much so you'll be able to see it better. So again, you're going to pull this side back a little bit and oh, you're just going to pull this triangle out. You're going to make sure that it's really flat. And then you're going to take and again, you're going to connect this side to this side. So you're gonna take the other end and you're gonna take it to the opposite end of where the tail is. So kind of like where his back leg's gonna be, okay? And you're just going to fold the rectangle back and oh, it's a big stretch. Oh, it's hard, but you can do it. And then you're just gonna pop this back here. And you're gonna make sure that that's all nice and even back there. And then you're gonna fold this crease up. Here we go. And then there's your triangle. And then you can kind of mess with the back a little bit and kind of like crease this in the back. Um, and back here, there might be an area where the backside kind of looks like it's sticking out a little bit. See that little triangle right there? If that happens, what you're gonna do is you're just gonna take it and you're gonna kind of fold it a little bit back. So that way it kind of looks like, it kind of looks like this. And then you're gonna fold it a little bit back on the other side. So that way it kind of, just so that way they're flat. And that's gonna be your dog's little feetsies in the back and that helps him stand up. So now you've got this and oh, it's looking, it's looking pretty close to a dog now, right? Just the biggest thing is you're gonna have to get underneath him. So you're just gonna pop him open just a little bit, boop. And in the middle of the creases here, you're gonna see this little triangle, right? And you're just gonna pull this out and fold it and fold it up. And then there's your dog's little head. Oh, and doesn't he look great? He's burk, 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 burk. Now, if you want to, and you wanna make sure that everybody knows how amazing your new dog is, you can take a marker. And we're just gonna draw two little eyes here. Just draw an eye on this side, kinda, kinda up here. And then draw, and then I'm just gonna come in here up at the front of his face and I'm just going to make a little mark and I'm going to color in next to it. So that way he's got a little nose. So you can put a little eye up here, you can put a little nose down here, then go to the other side and just again make an eye up top and then kind of make a little line up here near where the front is and color it in. And then we have a little dog. And then watch this. Oh, and he stands up. Bark, bark. Oh, yeah. Isn't that cool? And you know what? Let's, let's make our little dog a friend. How about that? So we're gonna stick him over here, just kind of chilling out. He wants, to, he wants to take a bit of a break. He just got put together, so I imagine that he's pretty tired. So again, I have another piece of paper. It's not origami paper, it's just regular paper. You can do this at, and you can do this at home with regular paper too, just the biggest thing is that it has to be a square. And so what you're gonna do is again, let's start over. We're going to fold our corners so that way our corners are diagonal. 
And again, you wanna make sure that your creases are really, really neat. So just kind of take your finger and just run them along where the creases are, just shoop, there they are. And again, if there's if there's a little extra where it kind of, you can kind of see the little, uh, the little extra bit here, don't worry about it, that's okay. They don't have to be perfect. So now you got one side and then we're going to take the other side and we're going to fold it again. So that way the creases are there. And you make that big X in the middle like we did before. Then you're going to take all the points on the square and you're gonna fold them into the center of the X. And while we're doing this, let's think of another quality. What other qualities are dogs known for? Um, dogs, let's see. Dogs can also be known for being, hmm, really good at sensing danger, right? Dogs know when things are happening, their ears are always perked up, they're kind of looking around all the time trying to figure out what's going on. A good thing to learn from dogs is to pay attention to things around you, kind of like how when your parents tell you that you should uh, cross the street, when you're crossing the street, you look both ways. So making sure that you look both ways across the street, pay attention to things around you to help you from, to keep you from getting hurt. Um, so that's a really good thing that dogs have. So okay, we folded all the corners in like we did before, took all of the corners and, fo and put them into that X in the middle. So now we're gonna take this triangle here like we did before and see how when you open it, there's another X there. There's kind of a cross here. There's a cross here too. So we're gonna take this point and we're gonna put it into the middle of that X and we're gonna smush it down so that way you've got a little bit here and then we're gonna fold that inward, okay? And then that's going to leave us with something that looks a lot like this, just like last time, right? And so then we're going to take the, we're going to take the corner opposite out of that. So that way it kind of looks like, it kind of looks like this. And we're going to take that opposite corner here and we're going to leave it down, but then take the point of it and kind of fold it backwards. So when we fold it backwards, we're not gonna fold it all the way back. We wanna leave a little bit, we wanna leave a little bit of space there. But that way, you fold it back like that. So that way it kind of looks like this when you're done with it. So you're gonna take the opposite corner and you're just gonna kind of make a crease a little bit in from where the from where the edge is, okay? And now we're gonna fold it in half like we did before. Oh. And oh, there's that little tail again. He's wagging, he's super excited to be a dog soon. What's one last quality we can think of about dogs before we finish this one? How about dogs that are good at finding things, right? Talking to your dog familiar, maybe when you lost something and you're looking for it can help you retrace your steps to where you were before. So right now we gotta make sure that this guy has a head so that way he can sniff things out. So right now we're going to take, well, he's laying flat like this. We're going to open him up. We're gonna take this flap out from underneath him. And we're gonna lay that flat. So that way it kind of looks like this. And then we're going to take this corner up front and this corner at the back, so kind of where his back legs are. And we're going to fold this back. So that way, that's kind of right. So that way it looks like that. So that way it's kind of open like this. But then we're gonna take this flap that's still there, we're just gonna push it back down so that way it looks like this. And again, looks really weird looking right now, but then we're gonna turn it around, we're gonna do the other side. So then laying this side flat, 
again, you're going to reach under there and you're just going to grab this big flap out again. And then you're gonna lay it flat here on the table. So that way it kind of looks like that. And you can see his other half of his head sticking out here. And then you're going to pull this back. So that way the front corner here, here, and the back corner here under the tail, you're gonna try and can you're gonna try and make those diagonal. And we're gonna fold that back. And all the adults at home are probably super excited about this too, especially the adults that have allergies, right? Everybody's so excited they get to make a dog today. What did you do this weekend? Oh, I made a dog. Super cool. All right. And now, like we did before, oh, there's a little bit of a snafu here. Let's see if I can fix that. Ba -ba -da. Come on, make that crease a little better there. See if that works. Yes, all right, it does. Okay, and again, like before, if he has some stuff kind of kind of sticking out on his tail here, you can kind of just like fold them backward on each side to kind of give him some feet. It depends on how you fold your paper before. So sometimes if your paper is super square, you don't have that problem, but I cut these out of big sheets of construction paper. So here's your dog, but he's almost done, not quite. So again, you're going to go underneath, you're gonna open him up, and where that big crease is in the middle, there's going to be this tiny triangle. You just wanna pull this up and kind of pop that out, and then close him up again, but take this tiny triangle and kind of puff it out a bit. And then, oh, there is a dog. And then we turn him back upside up, upside up. And oh, there's a little blue gray dog to hang out with the lime green dog. And of course, we have to give him eyes, right? I think this time, let's see. I'm gonna give him little, I'm gonna give him a little, I like before, I'm just gonna draw a big spot around it. So he kinda, he kinda has a spot on this side of his face. How does that look, huh? And then I'm just gonna give him a big wet black nose so he can sniff out some lost stuff. And then I'm gonna turn around on this side. I'm gonna draw another eye. And I don't think I'm gonna give him a spot on this side. I'm going to let him have an eye on this side that's just all by itself. And then again, I'm just gonna draw a nice little curved line there and fill it in to give him a big wet nose to give big wet kisses with. Maybe not while the marker is wet, but after that. All right, and now, we have two dogs, Woo. two dogs chilling out, hanging around with big ear legs and they can hop and play and hang out with each other. So that is how you make a dog out of origami. That's pretty cool, right? So let's see what we can do next. So now we've got our origami dogs. Let's do another origami familiar. So this one, I'm actually using origami paper for. So origami paper is special in that it has colors on one side and a white sheet on the other. Now you can do this with a plain white sheet of paper too, or you can do it with colored paper like the dogs. So this time, let's make a different animal rather than the dogs. So this time, with if you have origami paper at home, um, or even in, or just paper in general. So what you wanna do is if you do have origami paper, you're gonna put this side down. And if you don't have origami paper, don't worry about it. You can put whatever side down you want, but you wanna make sure if you do have special origami paper, the white side is up. So let's make, hmm, how about we make an owl? That sounds pretty cool, right? Yeah, so what we're gonna do, so we're, to make our owl, this is gonna be really easy. We're gonna take our paper, and we're going to put it like this so that way it's sitting in front of us kind of with the point at the top and the bottom. We're gonna take the bottom point and we're gonna fold it up to the top, right? And remember what I said about creases last time. We wanna make sure that we put it flat and then we kind of push them out with our fingers so that way they're super flat. 
And also, like I said last time, sometimes you'll have a little bit of extra paper along the side. Don't worry about it. Nothing has to be perfect. So, all right, now we've got this triangle here. So now we're going to take the top part of the triangle, we're in the middle here, and we're gonna fold it down so that way it's just barely, just a little bit outside from the bottom, from the bottom here. And we're gonna fold that just like that. So now it's kind of sitting and you've got a big diamond here in the middle, okay? And then we're going to, we're going to take the top one and we're gonna push this down and then we're gonna take the top tip and we're gonna push it down just a little bit. So that way it's not quite reaching the middle here, but it's just there. And you can kind of see now where our owl's face is gonna be. So now we've got, so now we've got a piece of paper and it should look like this, okay? So then we're gonna take it, we're gonna flip it upside down. We're going to stick them face down. Now, it kind of looks like, at this point, kind of like an owl in flight. So we need to make him some wings, all right? So what we're gonna do is we're gonna take this side of the paper, and this is kind of tricky. You wanna fold this corner in to where the top of the triangle is, or where the top of it is. So kind of where the edge of where you folded down his face before. And this crease can get a little thick because there's a lot of paper right here in the middle. So just kind of take it and run your finger along it to get it nice and flat. And don't worry if you don't quite get, it's kind of like you can see the front side here where there's a little bit sticking out. Don't worry if that happens. So all right. And then we're gonna take this piece of paper that we just folded back that kind of looks like, kind of looks like this now. And we're gonna take it and we're gonna fold it kind of vertically. So kind of uh, this way. And we're going to take the wing and we're gonna put it about right here. So kind of put it like this. So now you have, oof, spotted paper is weird for this. So you kind of took it and you folded it back and then from where you folded it back, you kind of folded it back in. So that way this top part of the wing is now over here, okay? So, all right, let's do that with the other side. It can be a little tricky. So you're gonna take it and like the, and the other side, like before, you're gonna fold it back so that way about where the top of the, where the owl's head is before, you fold there, and you're gonna fold it back. Oh, big creases. And then you're going to take, if you're looking at it, you're going to take this side and you're gonna fold it down like that. And don't worry if you have to ask a parent to help you. So that way you kind of fold it downward like this. So now the back side kind of looks like this, right? Now you kind of have two owl wings. And then when you flip them over, you have an owl, except he doesn't doesn't quite look like an owl yet, does he? Hmm. He needs some extra marker attention. Let's see if we can do that. So we're gonna grab some markers to help you with your owl. So sometimes you have to make a face on him. So what, what are we gonna do? We're gonna, gonna give him two eyes. Let's give him two big round eyes to see a lot of things. Oh, and then let's give him two pupils inside his eyes, the kind of like dark spots inside, so inside those circles that you just made up top. We're gonna make two smaller circles. We're gonna fill them in. Now he's starting to look like an owl, right? But doesn't he need a beak? Yeah. So take kind of this little flap of paper here and kind of on the tip of it, kind of make a triangle and fill that in. And look, 
There's his little beak. And now, let's see. On his kind of on his chest here, I just kind of make some kind of make some feathers for him. And you can just do that by just making some lines. Don't have to get super fancy. Down here at the bottom. Oh, I almost forgot. So down here at the bottom, you might see he's got a little tail sticking out here. So how about we crease that back? Just kind of put this back underneath and I'll fix that next time. We'll do this one again. And so now he kind of looks a bit more owly, doesn't he? And then you're just gonna give him a couple of little feet. And so now you have an owl. Pretty cool, right? Let's see if we can do that again. So that way we can kind of see a little more. And look, sometimes your owl has wings and he can fly. That's pretty cool, right? So we'll sit him on the table, see how well he can sit. Aha, he sits right here on the edge of the table. Perfect. Let's see if we can make another owl and see if Hollis can do this one just right. So again, we're gonna use another piece of paper like before, some origami paper, and we're gonna make another spotted owl. And we're going to put it white side up and we are going to start by what did we do the first time sometimes I forget okay so we're going to fold this bottom corner up to make a triangle the owl is a little bit harder than the dog then we're going to take this part here, and we're gonna fold it down, but not too far down. Let's put it about right here, okay? So that way we have a nice spot there in the middle. And then we're going to take, oh, come on. We're gonna take the top piece, and again, we're gonna fold it down, not quite towards the, not quite at the middle, but right here along the top. So now you have something that looks like this, right? Okay, just like before. And again, we're gonna fly him straight down. So now he looks like this. And then this is the hard part. So again, grab your parent if you need some help. And we're gonna fold this back. We're gonna fold this back. Let me see if I can get a better angle here so that way you guys can see it. So we're gonna fold this one backward. Big stretches, big creases. Owl's getting his stretches in. We're going to run our finger along this crease here. So that way it kind of looks, kind of looks like this. Okay. And then we're going to, let me see if I can do this up here so that way you guys can see it better. We're going to take this wing and we're gonna fold it down just like that. Okay, so that way it's sticking straight down there. And then kind of scoot him over a little bit. There we go. And then we're going to make a crease there. Oh, big creases, lots of folding here. Oof. So then it kind of looks like that instead. Kind of his wing folded behind his back. Let's do it with the other side again. So what kind of qualities do owls have? Owls are wise, right? That's something that we hear all the time in stories. Owls are really wise. Um, so having an owl in your pocket might help remind you to pay attention when you're learning new things. Kind of make sure that you're paying attention, especially when you're doing origami, for example because um, this can be really hard if you're not paying attention. Um, so we've pulled this wing over too, right? And then we're gonna fold it back like we did before. So that way it's right here. Um, what else do owls do? Sometimes, uh, sometimes you might wanna be loud. 
when you are supposed to be quiet, like maybe when you're going to school, maybe when you're about to go to bed, and owls are very quiet. So owls can kind of help you calm down and learn to be quiet when you're supposed to be quiet. But not always, sometimes owls are also really loud too. They're like, eee! So you know, you don't always have to be quiet. So your owl, again, the back of your owl should look like this. His wings folding over one another and he can use them to fly. So that's pretty cool. But right now we're gonna tuck his wings back there. And now here's the front of your owl. And let's see if we can remember to do the thing we're supposed to do this time where you take this tiny little piece here and you're going to lay your owl flat on his back again and kind of take that tiny, that tiny piece at the bottom and fold it up back here. So that way when your owl's wings are outstretched, his back kind of looks like that. But then we can put his wings back into place just like before and oh, his owl. Let's give him a face. Uh, patience, another important part of origami. Also pretty good for owls too, right? Let's make those big circles again, those big eye circles. Whoa! Owls have to have a lot of patience when they're trying to hunt for food. Eh, this owl kind of has, kind of has some uh, stuff in his face. Let me see if I can. There we go. One of his eyes is kind of covered, covered by his face here, but that's okay. It gives him character. Character means that sometimes, even when things aren't perfect, they can still look really nice. Make your own. When you make your own owl, you don't have to have him look perfect. Sometimes he can have little mistakes. You know, nobody's perfect, not even adults. And let's see, so patience for an owl, very important when they're hunting, when they're hanging out in the trees in the middle of the night. Um, sometimes when you're waiting in line, you might not wanna be patient, but especially when there are, especially when there's food involved. But you gotta remember to take your time. Things are gonna be all right. I'm gonna give him some lines around his face, just some, Line, so it kind of looks like, kind of looks like he's tired, because he's a night owl. Ha ha ha! Jokes. And then we're gonna make those little lines like we did before, all around his torso here. Kind of some long lines, some short lines. Kind of get those in here. Make a few of those. And then you're gonna make a couple of feet, just a long line for a foot, and then kind of stick, stick. Long line for a foot, stick, stick. So that way, it kind of looks like that. And there you go, there's an owl. And your owl can hang out with his owl friend and with his new dog friends too. And we're gonna make one more familiar. How about that? All right, so we did our dogs and we did our owls. And I bet you're wondering, Hollis, weren't we promised tigers? Well, it turns out you were. So we're gonna make a tiger, so. I don't have origami paper for tigers. I just have a regular piece of orange paper. If you have origami paper, you're gonna put it white side up, okay? So, we're gonna start off with a square, just like we did before. You're gonna take your square, you're gonna take the corner, and you're gonna fold it like this. You're gonna make another diagonal corner. Make sure your creases are really good, just like before. And again, don't worry if you have a little bit of overlap. Then you're going to take this, you're gonna put it point down and you're going to fold it over just like this. So you're gonna fold it in half, okay? And you're gonna fold it in half. Make sure your creases are nice and, nice and tight, just like they were before. So now you have kind of a smaller triangle. You're gonna open it up again. And you're gonna see there's a crease in the middle, okay? Now you're gonna take either side of the triangle and you're gonna fold it diagonal along the crease, okay? So you're going to match the top part of the triangle to the middle part. So you're gonna put it here. And again, fold it, make sure the creases are nice. And then you're gonna do it with the other side too. You're gonna fold it into the middle. 
Okay. All right. So we're getting our creases done here in the middle. Now what are tigers? They're fierce, right? So you have a tiger. Um, you can maybe have a hard time standing up to yourself or standing up for yourself to bullies. So maybe a tiger can kind of help you be a little brave. How does, how does that sound? Maybe help you gain a little bit of courage, maybe help you not be as shy. So, okay, so what you're gonna do now is you're going to take one side of this, so your, your square should look like this now, so this gets folded down here. You're going to take each side and you're kind of gonna bring it up and you're gonna crease it so that way it kind of looks like a big triangle right here, right? And I'll show you once I crease it. So you're gonna fold it, do a crease, and it's gonna kind of look like that. And you're gonna have a little bit of a triangle here, and you're gonna have a little bit of a triangle up here. So you kind of wanna make sure that you have an edge there and you kind of fold it diagonally along this line. And you're gonna do that again with the other side. So we're gonna fold it, and again, we're kind of trying to do it in a way that you're not quite folding all the way up to the corner. And you're gonna crease it. So then it's gonna look like this. Now then what you're gonna do is you're gonna take this point up here and you're gonna fold that in half. You're gonna bring it down and you're gonna put it kinda in the middle with the other ones here. And this can be a pretty difficult crease if you don't have origami paper. So you can kind of fold it here and kind of run your finger along it and make sure it's nice and tight. Okay, so now it kind of looks like this. Then you're gonna take these tiny corners in the corner and you're just gonna fold them back so they kind of cover over the ears, okay? So you kind of wanna, they're gonna help you hold the ears for your tiger in place. And you're just gonna tuck those corners in. And it's really, really tiny. It's a really tiny fold, so you can't see it very well. But you're basically just going to take like this little corner that's left and you're just gonna fold it inward. You're gonna do the same thing on this side. So then, and then this will lay flat. So you kind of have something that looks a little bit like this. Well, that doesn't look much like a tiger, does it? But when you turn it over, oh, now we're starting to get a cat face. So then you're gonna take your cat face you're gonna make sure all the creases are nice and flat, kind of rub your fingers along them, make sure that's all right. And then you're going to do something that's gonna be a little hard. So on the bottom, you should have two points and they are, they're gonna be kind of put together. It might get a little stuck. Let me see if I can pull them apart here. Come on. I don't have fingernails, so sometimes it's a little hard. Okay, so you see there's kind of a, there's kind of a gap in the middle here. You're gonna take both of those points on the bottom and you're gonna fold them up and kind of make a nice little triangle. So it's gonna look, it's gonna look like that. Then what you're gonna do is you're gonna untuck it, unfold it, and you're going to open it up. You're gonna take the bottom one and you're gonna kind of just tuck it in, tuck it inside. So that way you just have the one point here. And if you have origami paper, this part here is gonna be white, okay? And then you're just going to take the tip of the triangle and you're gonna point it down. So then you kind of have a you kind of have a nose there. And congratulations, you've just made a paper tiger, but it doesn't doesn't look much like a tiger right now, does it? Huh? So let's take our handy dandy marker that we use to draw on all the other ones. And then we're gonna make some designs on it, okay? We're going to color the tips of the ears, make the tips of the ears black, and be careful not to color on the table. We're gonna get the tips of the ears blacked out. Kinda. Boop, 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 boop. And sometimes if you have a little over, you might need to color in a little bit. There we go. We're gonna get the tips of the ears black and you gotta make sure the nose is black too, right? So we're gonna 
color in the nose. And the nose can be a little hard, so don't be afraid to work on it for a minute. Make sure that you don't color underneath it. So now we got the nose and the ears. What else does he need? He needs eyes, doesn't he? So let's, uh, let's give him some eyes. I'm gonna give him some Calvin and Hobbes eyes. You guys are probably too young to understand what that is, but that's okay. Your parents will think it's funny. All right. Now he's got some eyes, but he still kind of kind of looks like a cat. So you know what else he needs? He needs some stripes. Let's put a stripe in the middle of his forehead here and kind of just draw some triangles. So that way he has those three triangles up top and then kind of fill them in with your marker. And then let's give him, let's give him some stripes over here. We'll give him stripe here, stripe here, stripe here. Let's fill those in. And then let's give him stripes to match on the other side. Let's give him a stripe here and a stripe here and a stripe here. And then we'll fill those in. And then there you go. You've got a tiger. Ta-da! So let's make a second one, huh? Let's see, let's stick him. Let's stick him over here, kind of with the owls and the dog. He can, he's a little big, isn't he? But tigers are really big. So, all right, start from the beginning. So again, just regular paper, but if you have origami paper, make sure the white side is up, okay? So we're gonna take your paper and we're gonna fold it into a corner here. All right, make sure that crease is Nice and flat. Ooh, be careful. That would be bad, Hollis. All right, and then let's see. And from here, we're gonna fold into a quarter again. So we're gonna fold them in half. And again, make sure that you're folding it nice, that your crease is nice and flat. And then we open that up. So now you have a big crease in the middle, just like we did before. And then you're going to take corner and you're gonna bring it down to the bottom corner. So bring the left corner down to the bottom corner and then <laughs> fold that down. Then bring the right corner down to the bottom corner. Make sure you get a nice crease at the top. That way it's Nice and flat, and then get all that. All right, now you have your square. And then we do what we did before, where we, and you know what helps sometimes is to hold the corner down while you're folding this back, so that way the corner doesn't come up with it. So we're gonna make two ears. and put down the crease and hold the corner down and pull this back and try to match it up kind of with where the corner is in the middle here. So kind of, let's see. Hold the corner down and kind of crease it. So if you're holding, so if you line it up right, then you've got a diamond kind of at the top here, a, a square. Kind of right there. And then we're gonna take that square and we're gonna fold it. So that way the top of our tiger's head is flat. Because as far as I'm aware, tigers don't have horns. And we're gonna 
get that crease. And again, this crease will be really, really hard because there's a lot of paper there. So you're gonna have to squish it down a little bit. So that way it's nice and flat, just like that. And then take these little corners and just push them in. See, so that way it's right there. And then take this little corner too, right here, and just push it in. There we go. And then you've got the back of your tiger's head. We're gonna spin him around. And look, there he is. Let's see, what else do we know about tigers? Um, tigers uh, climb trees and run through water and they uh, like to, and they have to catch their food. So if, so tigers kind of have to be graceful, right? So let's take the bottom of our tiger's, tiger's face here and we're gonna turn it up in a triangle. So if you have some problems, maybe being graceful, maybe you wanna be fast on your feet, you need to have quick thinking. A tiger is really good for that. And then we kinda of push this together. And so now we have a triangle. And then what you're gonna do is again, like there's two triangles here, kinda of see? I'm gonna take the bottom one, you're gonna kinda of open it up, and you're gonna tuck that bottom one underneath. So you just have one triangle here, okay? And then from here, we're just going to take the tip of the triangle, gonna push it down, so that way it sits just right there above that. There's your tiger's head again. Now let's color them in. All right. And then what else about tigers? Tigers like to be by themselves a lot. They don't like being around people very much, which is probably good for people. But if you have a hard time maybe being alone, maybe you, uh, maybe you are having a hard time right now when you kind of have to be all by yourself and you don't get to see your friends as much, a tiger can help you kind of learn how to be alone and how to enjoy being alone. So that way you don't feel sad that you can't be playing with your friends right now, or you don't feel sad that you don't, you aren't going to school. So let's see, we got our tiger's ears colored in and I'll give him good eyes this time. Let's see, I'm gonna give him oval eyes. So I'm gonna like put this and then this and then kind of make a slit in the middle. And then let's see, make a curve line and another curve line and put a line in the middle. How's that look? That give him some interesting tiger eyes there. And let's not forget that we need to color in his nose. Tigers need a good nose so that way they can smell what they're hunting. Doo, 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 doo. And so now you have a lot of animal companions to choose from. And there's a lot more too. If you really enjoyed doing origami with me and you want to maybe make more animals, you can ask your parents to help you look up animals online. And there's a lot of videos that you can watch that'll have you do a bunch of different animals too. I had a really hard time picking more animals that we could do for today. Um, I only could get three because that's all that we had time for. But I also like making cranes and butterflies, hummingbirds, whales, There are some other cats, although this doesn't always have to be a tiger. You can fold this and you can make it into any cat you want, really. I was just told that I should make tigers, so I made tigers. And then you just can have all sorts of animals that can just hang out with you on paper, don't have to change their litter box, which is really nice. And yeah, there we go. And there's our last tiger. So from all of our little familiar friends here, 
I just want to say thank you for coming to the workshop and thank you for saying hi to everybody. And, uh, and we'll see you all later. Bye. Have a good time. All right, so now we're on to making our origami familiars. So we're going to make each origami familiar, like I said, two times. So the first one we're gonna make is a dog. So we are going to make an origami dog. I have a big piece of paper, um, and this piece of paper is not an origami paper, so it doesn't have a white side or a and a colored side. It's the same color on both sides so that way you can follow along with just regular colored paper instead of origami paper. So the first thing that we're gonna do to make our origami dog is we are going to fold the paper diagonally. So we're going to fold it so that way the opposite corners are touching. And what you want to do when you're folding this is you want to take your finger and you want to run it along the crease so that way the crease is nice and neat. And you can even see here, creases don't have to be perfect. There can be a little, there can be a little bit on the end. So don't worry if it's not perfectly done, okay? So you made it a new triangle and then you're going to open it up and lay it flat again. And you can kind of see there's a crease in the paper and then we're going to fold it the opposite way, okay? So we're gonna fold it corner to corner again, but we're going to go the other way. And we're going to lay it flat, and we're gonna run our fingers along the crease again. And again, this paper isn't a perfect square, so there's a little bit hanging over the sides here like it before, but don't worry about it. So we're gonna open the piece of paper up, and now you should have a piece of paper that looks like this where it's got a big X in the middle. So now after we do that and you've got your piece of paper with the X in the middle, we're going to take all of the corners of the piece of paper and we're gonna fold them into the middle. So you take the corner, and you're gonna put it right here in the middle of the X. And you're gonna fold that and again you want to take your finger you want to run it along the edge so that way it's nice and flat and you're going to do that with all four sides you're going to fold it in in the middle do, do, do. now while you're doing this think of why you would want a dog for an origami familiar so what kind of qualities does a dog have that would make you want to have a dog around. So dogs are really loyal. Um, listening to your dog familiar might help you be a better friend. So if you wanna be a better friend, sometimes watching a dog and seeing what dogs do can kinda of help you figure out what to do with your friends. Uh, now we've got all of our little corners here in the middle. So you folded all of them up so all of them in the middle here. So now we've got what looks like a smaller square right here in the middle, all right? So next, after we fold all of our pieces in the middle here, we're going to take one of the pieces, let's take this piece. We're going to take this piece, so you're gonna take your left hand and you're gonna fold this piece out. And you're just going to have it so that way it's out and then you're gonna take the point and where the edge of the paper is right here, you are going to fold the tip of the point here into the center of that little X. So that way it meets the edge of the paper. So then it's gonna look like this, okay? 
So there's going to be a little X in the middle there, and you're going to put the point there. All right, and then you're gonna fold that back in, so that way it kind of looks like the point is gone. So that way it kind of looks like this when you're looking at it. So, then we're gonna take out this point here, okay? And we're gonna take this point here, and we're actually going to um, put it so that way the point is pointed backwards. So now we're taking this point and we're kind of folding it, not quite just to the edge, but we wanna fold it a little bit over the edge. So that way it kind of looks like this. And you kind of wanna fold it like that. You wanna run your finger along the crease like before. So now if you're looking at your piece of paper, it's gonna look like that, okay? So now, got the piece of paper kind of looking like this. And then you're gonna fold the piece of paper and you're gonna fold it in half. You're gonna take that, you're just gonna bend it, and there should be a crease here already, so you don't have to worry about uh, bending it again. You're gonna fold your piece of paper in half, and you're gonna lay it flat. You wanna run your hands over it, make sure all the creases are tight and tiny, and oh, what's, what's that here? What's that? I think it's, I think it's your little dog's tail, and it's wagging, so you're already halfway there. You're doing a really good job, okay? So then this is the hard part. So now you have a piece of paper and it's gonna look like this. And you've got your little dog tail crease. You wanna make sure that this is a crease here and then there's this little underside here. And then you're going to fold in flat and you're going to take the inside here and you're gonna pull out this little flap, okay? You're gonna pull that out and kind of lay it flat and then you're going to take the paper here and you're gonna kind of make a crease along right here. So you're going to pull this back and you're going to make a crease along the top corner and the bottom corner. So you're kind of going diagonal across this rectangle. And then you're gonna fold that backward. And you're going to push it down and you're gonna kind of crease it and fold that back. So that way that's creased. And then you're going to take, oh, my crease is a little off. Let's see if I can fix that. When you fold it back, you should be able to go all the way to the edge of the rectangle. So my crease is a little messed up, but that's okay. Mistakes happen. And then you're gonna fold this back and then you should have kind of a triangle here. So that way it's gonna look like this, okay? So your triangle is going to fit right along the edge of this rectangle. And you're going to have this weird looking thing right here. And you're probably gonna wonder, what is this? It doesn't look like a dog anymore. Don't worry, we're gonna do the same thing to the other side. And hopefully this time I won't mess up the crease too much so you'll be able to see it better. So again, you're going to pull this side back a little bit and oh, you're just gonna pull this triangle out you're gonna make sure that it's really flat. And then you're going to take, and again, you're going to connect this side to this side. So you're gonna take the other end and you're gonna take it to the opposite end of where the tail is. So kind of like where his back leg's gonna be, okay? And you're just going to fold the rectangle back. And oh, it's a big stretch. Oh, it's hard, but you can do it. And then you're just gonna pop this back here you're gonna make sure that that's all nice and even back there. And then you're gonna fold this crease up. There we go. And then there's your triangle. And then you can kind of mess with the back a little bit and kind of like crease this in the back. Um, and back here, there might be an area where the backside kind of looks like it's sticking out a little bit. See that little triangle right there? If that happens, what you're gonna do is you're just gonna take it and you're gonna kind of fold it a little bit back. So that way it kind of looks like, it kind of looks like this. And then you're gonna fold it a little bit back on the other side. So that way it kind of, just so that way they're flat. And that's gonna be your dog's little feetsies in the back. And that helps him stand up. 
So now you've got this, and oh, it's looking, it's looking pretty close to a dog now, right? Just the biggest thing is you're gonna have to get underneath him, so you're just gonna pop him open just a little bit, boop. And in the middle of the creases here, you're gonna see this little triangle, right? And you're just gonna pull this out and fold it and fold it up. And then there's your dog's little head. Oh, and doesn't he look great? He's buck, 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 buck. Now, if you want to, and you wanna make sure that everybody knows how amazing your new dog is, you can take a marker and we're just gonna draw two little eyes here. Just draw an eye on this side, kinda, kinda up here and then draw, and then I'm just gonna come in here up at the front of his face, and I'm just gonna make a little mark, and I'm gonna color in next to it. So that way he's got a little nose. So you can put a little eye up here, you can put a little nose down here, then go to the other side, and just again, make an eye up top, and then kinda make a little line up here near where the front is and color it in. Oh. And then we have a little dog. And then watch this. Oh, and he stands up. Bark, bark. Oh, yeah. Isn't that cool? And you know what? Let's, let's make our little dog a friend. How about that? So we're gonna stick him over here, just kind of chilling out. He wants to he wants to take a bit of a break. He just got put together, so I imagine that he's pretty tired. So again, I have another piece of paper. It's not origami paper, it's just regular paper. You can do this at and you can do this at home with regular paper too. Just the biggest thing is that it has to be a square. And so what you're gonna do is again, let's start over. We're going to fold our corners. So that way our corners are diagonal. And again, you wanna make sure that your creases are really, really neat. So just kind of take your finger and just run them along where the creases are, just shoop, there they are. And again, if there's if there's a little extra where it kinda, you can kinda see the little, uh, the little extra bit here, don't worry about it, that's okay. They don't have to be perfect. So now you got one side and then we're going to take the other side and we're going to Fold it again, so that way the creases are there. And you make that big X in the middle, like we did before. Then you're going to take all the points on the square and you're gonna fold them into the center of the X. And while we're doing this, let's think of another quality. What other qualities are dogs known for? Um, dogs, let's see. Dogs can also be known for being hmm, really good at sensing danger, right? Dogs know when things are happening, their ears are always perked up, they're kind of looking around all the time trying to figure out what's going on. A good thing to learn from dogs is to pay attention to things around you, kind of like how when your parents tell you that you should uh, cross the street. When you're crossing the street, you look both ways. So making sure that you look both ways across the street, pay attention to things around you to help you from, to keep you from getting hurt. Um, so that's a really good thing that dogs have. So okay, we folded all the corners in like we did before, took all of the corners and, and put them into that X in the middle. So now we're gonna take this triangle here, like we did before, and see how when you open it, there's another X there. There's kind of a cross here. There's a cross here too. So we're gonna take this point and we're gonna put it into the middle of that X. And we're gonna smush it down. So that way you've got a little bit here. And then we're gonna fold that inward, okay? And then that's going to leave us with something that looks a lot like this, just like last time, right? And so then we're going to take the we're going to take the corner opposite out of that. So that way it kind of looks like it kind of looks like this. And we're going to 
take that
protection and blessing herbs. What we're going to be doing today is taking a look at some herbs that you can use for protection. But there's also a well-being dimension to this workshop because most of the herbs that have the folk magic uses for protection also are healing herbs and that can help bring about well-being. My name is Selena Fox and I'm Senior Minister at Circle Sanctuary. I am so grateful to be able to be with you all today through this live stream. And yes, as those of you who have been with us throughout the day know, we're trying something new this time. We are doing this live stream to this private YouTube channel and there is a chat function. So that's a fabulous thing. Uh, Bob is going to be taking a look at questions that come in and collecting them. And then towards the end of the workshop, I'll be answering questions. The other person helping me is another one of our Circle Sanctuary ministers, Casey Pope, who does our social media. And she will be putting, um, looking at your comments and also putting in a link pretty soon about home blessing herbs. And that link is actually to a handout sheet that I have used and developed over the years. I put it in as a Facebook note. I do blog on Facebook under an old system they had years ago that is still active for my page. My main page on Facebook is Selena Fox Updates. And should you have any problem accessing that link, you can go to the Facebook app and Type in Selena Fox updates and you'll get the information. I also want to let you know that I live in a forest that adjoins Circle Sanctuary Nature Preserve. We get our internet by satellite. We have done some preliminary testing of this week to make sure that everything we possibly can do to bring this live to you from this location will work. We're lucky in that it's sunny today, but what I have no control over is how many other people are using the satellite in this area and beyond and what that might do to this workshop. If you find me disappearing and some technical difficulties image coming up on the screen, know that I am doing my backup plan, which is called going to the local village, parking in the parking lot in front of the public library and rejoining with broadband. <laughs> but let's hope we don't have to do that. So I'd like to begin with an honoring of the green spirits, of the herbs, and invite them to be with us as I share some lore and some practical uses. Green spirits, we call to you. Green spirits, we honor you. Green spirits, come to us. Green spirits, work with us. We call to you, we honor you, we celebrate you. Be our teachers, be our guides, be our helpers. Many thanks. So be it. Wow, you will see on my altar here, my working table altar, that I have a variety of different herbs and things. I'm gonna share some information about herbs for protection for your home and also for yourself. 
There have been a series of excellent presentations so far in this Welcome Fall Festival. And I see what I'll be doing today is complementing information that's already been shared. I'm going to invite you, if you wish to do so, to join me in crafting a witch bottle in the second part of our workshop together. What do you need for that? In case you haven't had a chance to get an empty bottle with a lid and some favorite herbs, well, I'm gonna give you a few moments as I do some additional introductory remarks to get that. It can be a canning jar. It's ideally something that has a lid that will fit on tightly. I prefer for a witch bottle to have glass and a metal top. And if you prefer, you might get a glass herb jar. I recycle a lot of things and I've been recycling glass for a long time. And how I do that is once it's been served its original purpose, a lot of these glass bottles and jars I use to store herbs in a cabinet. What I'm going to be using today is sometimes called a jelly jar. And this too has a lid. It's a smaller jar than the canning jar. And indeed, some canning jars are quite huge. And how big of a jar to use, it depends on where you want to put it. Well, um, get what is available today for you, or if you don't want to make it live with me today, then you will get some information and you can craft it later. An example of, this used to have mustard in it. This is my mustard jar that's turned into a witch bottle. And I am continuing to evolve my work with herbs. I continue to learn from the herbs themselves as well as from practitioners in a number of traditions. For protection herbs at equinox time, why equinox time? You certainly can gather them at any time and uh, make these charms and work with things. But equinox is a really powerful time to do things for protection and well-being, especially as we head into the equinox, which is sometimes known as the tides of the equinox, just as waves come and crash and rise and fall. If you're going to do surfing, if any of you've done surfing, yes, earlier in this life, I was on a surfboard, but did some body surfing. You have to catch the wave just as it's going up, and then it will take you all the way into shore, ideally. Well, that's what the equinox tides are. So you can make your witch bottle today, or sometime in the next few days, you'll still be catching that tidal wave. Equinox this year is on Tuesday. It also is new moon time. New moon, dark moon, that transition actually happened a couple of days ago, but some people actually celebrate new moon and do the new moon magic as the moon becomes visible in the sky, very thin crescent. So this too is a really powerful time to do work. Why do protection with herb work? Well, we have protection kind of built into our lives and into ourselves as part of being human beings. Indeed, protection for our bodies begins with our skin. And it, we know it's important to take good care of our body as a whole and our skin in particular. 
In addition to our skin, hair, our whole body, many traditions, including the ones that I am familiar with in practice, recognize in addition to the physical body, there is also an energy body. Different systems will have different ways of conceptualizing and defining that. Many people call it the aura. Essentially, when you're doing protection work for self, you are working physically, emotionally, mentally, energetically, and spiritually. In like fashion for your home, there is the physical place where you dwell. But in addition to that, you have what you might call bodies of energy. What kind of communications and learning happens in that space? What are the emotions that flow through that space? What are the energetics of that space? What is the overall spiritual vibe of the place? So we're going to take a look at protection and um, well-being herbs for self and home, working with the elements of nature. And I will give a sampling of the herb lore that's available. In talking about the elements of nature, what I'll be sharing with you has to do with forms of herbs that we'll be using rather and, than the traditions that assign an elemental association with a particular herb. Let's start with the herbs of earth. So if you're gonna do protection work with herbal earth dimensions, what is that like? You're actually working with the physical herbs in their fresh or dried form. I have some anise hyssop here. Many people like to have fresh herbs growing in a windowsill or clipped and put into a container such as this. Some people like to have fresh flowers in their home in addition to being aesthetically pleasing, depending on what you're using, can also serve as something healing and protective. Some people grow herbs next to their house if they're in a house or if in an apartment or some other dwelling, may grow them in containers and actually have living plants that are part of the protective dimension. Yarrow is one of those herbs that has been used for protection in a variety of different ways. And what I like about yarrow is after it blooms, which is typically around the summer solstice, time and then it lasts through Lunasa or what we call our Green Spirit Festival, our Herb Crafting Festival. Then it starts getting brown um, seed heads like this, a way that the herb propagates itself. And what's fabulous about this is they can make really wonderful arrangements. So you could go out now and harvest some Yarrow, if you are have access to a place where that is, and you can actually put it in an arrangement, and that's a way to have an earth type of protective amulet for your home. Amulets, herbal amulets. This is a really old herbal amulet. It's been with me in many herb workshops. It's sometimes known as the golden bough. It's mistletoe. And 
Many people associate it with Yuletide, for indeed it has long been associated with celebrating that seasonal holiday. And kissing under the mistletoe at Yuletide is something that goes across a lot of faith and cultural traditions. But long before it got very linked with romance in Yuletide, it was used as an herb of peace and it would be hung in gathering halls where people met as something to bring peace and people would make oaths under it. And it was protective of people following through on their oaths. And mistletoe is something that's good to protect home year round. However, Parts of the fresh plant don't sit well with some creatures and some young humans. It's best to make sure that if you have young children or animals in your home that you, you and you're using mistletoe, put it way up out of their reach so everyone stays safe instead of having a problem. So it is protection from arguments. It can be protection against chaos, but it also has been used as protection against bad weather. And with this age of climate instability and chaos, it's good to get some mistletoe in one's home. Lavender. This is a lavender wand that was handcrafted in France. I got it a number of years ago when I was in Europe speaking at an international conference. And some charms for protecting self and others can be crafted and be used as a decoration and visitors to the home may not have a clue that that's actually something magical. They'll see it more as folk art. And lavender not only dispels stress, but it helps bring a calm and a centeredness. We'll I'll talk more about this during witch bottle making. Mother Nature's Velcro, burdock. This is a great time to go out and get burdock burrs. And why are they associated with protection? Well, they, <laughs> they, they are very resilient and very resourceful and they are very pointy. And so you have to make sure if you're harvesting them Ideally with gloves, that will be great. So you may want to put a burdock burr in a witch bottle. You may want to put it in some kind of charm that you carry on your person. Um, and there's a healing dimension to burdock itself. Its root has been used in herbal medicine. Uh, across a number of different traditions around the world to purify the blood. Uh, it's just a very powerful and very um, intense herb, and it can be quite exuberant if you have it growing um, around where you live. Air, herbs of air for protection. Well, incense. You can burn incense in a variety of ways. Frankincense is a really powerful herb for protection and for cleansing away. With protective herbs, you want to be able to clear a space of anything negative, but you also want to be able to ward off what is not wanted. And frankincense has been burned since pagan times of antiquity as one of those substances that raises the vibrations of a place 
and cleanses away what is not needed. It's used amongst many different peoples and it takes a lot of different forms. I also like to burn it in its pure gum resin form on a self-igniting charcoal block and where you fume it. That's another way of getting the incense into the air. And then you can use it to bless yourself. If you've been in, if you've had a close encounter of a problematic kind with somebody um, and you've gotten home and you're still feeling, yeah, this is not good. Well, one very basic thing to do is to burn some incense, ideally an incense that is purifying, healing, and protective. And, and smudge yourself with it, sense yourself with it. And should um, you need to do so, let's say you've been online and you had some intense encounter with somebody that way, well, smudge your area. I mean, it's wonderful because it not only is visibly doing its thing, but it can be a wonderful thing to breathe. Now, not everybody lives in a place where you can burn things like incense. I know when I, before the pandemic, I traveled a lot in speaking at conferences and festivals and other events and often would be in a hotel room with no smoking. So how do you put something into the air to bless and protect your space and yourself under those circumstances? There are options for that. One of my favorite options is a spritzer. And this was made by some pagans. It's Persephone's Kiss. And I've used it to freshen up a space, dispel um, negativity. And of course you can do it on yourself, but know what the ingredients are and how your skin reacts to such things. In addition, sometimes I go into hospitals, haven't done that for a while, except by phone and by Zoom and FaceTime and all those other video conferencing things. That's what I've been doing since the pandemic set down. Uh, one of the ways that I have used scent and herbal scent as a way of bringing some cleansing, some healing and well-being within a hospital setting is with oil and a fan. Lavender in oil form here. And you only need a little bit of it and you place it on the fan. And then <sighs> you can fan yourself and you can fan the space around you. So if you're in a no smoking situation, this is a way that you can use scent of herbs to aid you. And then we have fire. What are some herbs that you can work with in a flaming way? Most people work with scented candles as part of their practice and that scent is derived in some cases derived from herbs and that is a way that you can work with protective herbs in a sacred fire way but one of the ways that i really enjoy working with protective herbs to bless my home and to bless myself is 
to actually burn the herbs. Now I have a hearth fire. It's part of our range of heating options here at our rural home in the forest of southwestern Wisconsin, USA. And we supplement our heat with a very large wood fireplace. So part of what I find is a powerful thing to do is to go in, sit by the hearth fire and take some dried herbs and to cast them into the fire and to bring about cleansing, to aid warding. And it really is fun to do that. Now, if you're in a place where you can go outside and have a bonfire, a campfire, or some other kind of fire, then that's another way that you can work with protective herbs to deliver their magic. Mullen. At this time of year, equinox time, the yellow flowers of the mullen have all faded and dropped off. And now it's you'll get these seed heads. In fact, mullen, which is a biennial plant, which means it lasts for two years in its life cycle and then it sells seeds, is connected with healing, well-being, purifying, inner visions, and it's also a great herb to burn. One of the things that I have used mullen for is to dip the top of a stalk, and this is just part of a much taller stalk. I have a mullen outside my house that's seven feet tall or more. Um, after it completes its whole life, I'm going to harvest that and then it will go into my mullen stalk collection. So I will um, take some oil. It might be lamp oil or it might be dabbing with essential oil or I often will use some kind of candle wax and drip it over this part of the stalk and then let it set, and then it can be used as a torch. In fact, it's sometimes known as witch's candle or hag's taper. It's an amazing herb. And for me, it not only is something I work with in a flambeau way, but it grows outside my front door. So it is a kind of earth guardian as well. So for water, this involves taking very hot water usually and creating a tea. Now I started this basil tea wash right before this workshop. And basil, is an amazing plant. Now here in Wisconsin, uh, it um, has to be protected in the fall as the temperatures dip down. Once it gets below 40 degrees Fahrenheit, it starts getting stunted. It does not like freezing cold weather. And certainly some of my herbs that grow outside my front door, the time will last and last and last. Most herbs that are perennials can take at least down to like 20 degrees Fahrenheit um, before they really go into their winter repose. Um, basil is an annual here. And I um, some people grow it year round in containers and that's way to do it. But it's, it's essentially, it's an annual. And I love planting it in the garden. So what you want to do, you bring water up to a boil and you put it in some kind of container. And then you take fresh or dried leaves and you smush them up. 
pan. If you don't have a wooden spoon, add it to your to-do list. I love, you can use any kind of spoon, but wooden spoons are really magical. They're kind of wand. And as you make the tea, you honor the spirit of the basil and you invite the basil to put its protective and healing and well-being qualities into this solution. And you want to let it steep and get cooled. And then you can use it as a wash. Now, one way of using it as a wash is you can use a technique called aspersion. If any of you were raised Roman Catholic, I was not, but I've had enough interreligious connections these days, including doing um, funerals and other ceremonies at Roman Catholic cemeteries. There's a really nifty aspurging tool that I got to use a um, number of years ago. But you can do your own kind of aspurging tool. Once you have created your tea, you turn it into a wash, into a sacred potion for protection. You dip in. And I'm using the mint to bring protection. Now, ideally, you are able to do blessing for yourself as well as your home environment. Most people find it helpful to make the tea, let it steep, and put a lid over the container to keep the essential oils in. Once it is cooled, then what you want to do is strain it, and then you can take that wash and you can sprinkle it around your threshold. Some people will actually dip a sponge or a rag in it and wash the threshold, the walkway, as well as the area around the door. So that is a way to do a protective wash. And yes, most people have good relation with basil and can actually consume it. So another way to work with protective herbs is to actually make a tea that you drink. And it isn't just a matter of creating the tea, it's your process of taking it into yourself setting yourself down, centering yourself, taking in the herbal tea, which most of us call potions because it's a herbal tea with a magical zing to it. And then as you relax and take that tea in, experiencing it working within you and around you. And then the spirit use of herbs for protection. That's usually taking the form of some kind of a crafted charm. And today we have witch bottles. So I'm gonna demonstrate a way to make a witch bottle. If you have a jar and you have some favorite herbs and some ingredients, we'll get a good start on it today. And if you do not, then you will have a chance to learn this method and be able to work with it later. So finding the jar, taking off the lid, and then you want to do a blessing of your jar. So one of my favorite ways is to hold the jar upside down, put some incense in it, and not only bless the jar itself, 
but it's lid and the space where you are doing this work. Next, if you have something, some dirt from your home area or something else that's grown or is connected with your home, you want to put that in next. And I am actually using an acorn, which is also a protective charm that many people will carry an acorn or put it in their vehicle and or put it in a witch bottle like I'm doing here. I put it in to represent my home. Salt is another ingredient. And while it's not an herb, it's from the mineral realm, it is a traditional ingredient for home blessing. Some people will scatter salt around their home to bless it. Some people find when they're really stressed out, they take a bit of salt and will rub it in their hands to dispel negativity. Some people will use salt around their whole home area. Now, you shouldn't use a lot of salt in a garden because most plants don't get along with salt. Uh, but in a witch bottle, it's a really good place to um, put some salt. And as you put in the salt, call to mind purification. Call upon the powers of prosperity and well-being. Indeed, the word salt and the use of salt is connected with the word salary. What? In ancient Roman times, the troops often got paid in salt because it was such a valuable commodity. Another one of my favorite ingredients is angelica seeds. And angelica seeds are also ripe for harvesting right now. At Circle Sanctuary Nature Preserve, we have Angelica growing at Bridget Spring and along our stream of consciousness. Yes, that's the name of the stream that flows through Circle Sanctuary. And, and I'm very thankful that we had some beautiful images of that stream. So as I put in the um, Angelica seeds, I call to mind blessings of well-being for the home, but also the power of Angelica to ward off negativity, um, negative people coming forth, um, negative circumstances. I'm going to take a bit of basil, fresh basil. And I put that in to bless the home with good health and happiness, love, joy, and to ward off theft and other um, problems of humankind that you don't really want to have as part of your home environment. And I take a burdock to be a kind of guardian, to watch over the space and to put out some prickly energy to keep those who are not right from coming. I have a number of herbs that I've harvested. Whorehound, which is used in cough medicine, um, they're often in the form of candy, is something that helps many people with the respiratory conditions. And knowing that we have COVID out and about, I brought whorehound today, and I'm smooshing it up, as well as mullen, another respiratory herb, 
and I'm putting in bits of mullen toward my home and from disease. Also in my herb basket are some additional herbs including this one which I harvested yesterday for use today so I could handle it without gloves. It's stinging nettles and stinging nettles is a really powerful healing plant. I've eaten the leaves steam. The stingers are um, disabled when you use it as a food stuff in that way. But I, it's flowering right now. And this is a really powerful time to get some nettles and to add that to the witch bottle. I take some mint for joy, well-being, and to ward off depression and negative mental states. And I've got my yarrow here. And we'll be putting in some of the yarrow flowers. Yarrow has so many different uses. And you can use the flowers. And I'm also going to take off the leaves, which are already dried here. Yarrow is also associated with love. So in addition to protecting the home, and serving as an herb that wards off problems and attacks. It's an herb of love. Indeed, it's an old folk tradition that you take yarrow to a wedding and give it to the couple. And in doing so, it symbolizes lasting love. I also have some water that's been blessed and actually has some water from some sacred sites, including Bridget Spring at Circle Sanctuary Nature Preserve. Now, some people will do their witch bottle totally dry. Some people like to put a bit of fluid in it. I won't go into some of the fluids from the Middle Ages. Um, <laughs> in great detail now, but you do not have to pee into your witch bottle in order for it to be effective, nor do you have to put any of your personal blood in a witch bottle. Indeed, I'm a big fan of working with herbs and other natural ingredients. In addition to putting in herbs, one of uh, this really goes back to ancient Roman times where people would use pins and bits of metal, bent nails. Well, a paper clip can work really well. And I like to put in several um, bent paper clips. And why do you put them in a witch bottle? Well, the folk craft around that is they serve as a confusion device. So if negative thoughts, negative intentions, negativity is being directed to your home, these take that and ground it out, confuse it, release it. Similar to what a dream catcher is designed to do in a number of traditions where the negative dreams are caught in the web and dreams of healing and well-being flow right through to the dreamer.
I couldn't do an herb workshop without having some mugwort. A mugwort Artemisia vulgaris is you is such a versatile herb and it can be used to bless the home in a lot of different ways. I'm going to take some of this dried mugwort and put it here in the witch bottle. But I also want to show you this wreath because another way of being able to work with protective herbs in their earth form is to actually to craft a wreath from the stems. And, and mugwort dries fairly well. Now, you can also use it as a crown. Um, I crafted this at a green spirit a number of years ago and I um, have harvested some of the mugwort flowers and leaves here for use. And there are many other types of protective herbs. This is motherwort. This also grows as a home guardian outside my home. And after motherwort goes into bloom, it gets these really prickly bits. And protective herbs may have some prickles connected with them, not only burdock, but motherwort is an herb that physically helps many people with heart issues and psychologically and emotionally with emotional issues. So we are putting this in to ward off negativity as well as to bring forth love and peace and understanding. In the chat, Casey has put my guide to home blessing herbs. And you'll notice that there are quite a few herbs here. This is just a sampling of herbs and some of their traditional uses and my own personal experiences working with these herbs in a variety of ways. And each type of herb has its own kind of lore and connection. One of the things that is helpful as you do herb work, protective herb work, herbs for inspiration, herbs for divination, herbs to celebrate the seasons and the moons, there's a whole host of ways of working with herbs and their spiritual essences to enhance life and to strengthen the connection between humankind and the green world. It's good to begin, if you're still in the early stages of learning herb craft, start learning about a few herbs and get to know them well. Ideally work with them in fresh living forms as well as work in dried forms. Not everyone is able to really do the gardening, the wild crafting or um, to really work with the living plants. But certainly, if you're working with dried plants as your way of connecting, then spend some time with them, study about it, um, check what other people's experiences have been. And if you're going to get some information from the internet, look at the source. Who has put this information together and what's their expertise? and to check several sources. One of the amazing things about herb crafting is many different people have different experiences and will share that. So if you see some stuff that doesn't seem to all be congruent, that may be more a function of the culture and the spiritual tradition that the practitioner is connected with and their own personal experiences with this. After you have done your herb um, selection and you've put things in, I'm going to add a few more things. Some yarrow leaves from the other day. And I also have some rosemary that I'm putting in. And some sage. Sage um, is burnt 
This is the European sage. There's also a different plant that is in the Artemisia um, sector of herb realms, um, white sage that can grow in prairies and other places. So what you want to do is pick a sage that you attune to, and I'm putting that in for wisdom and insight. And once you've gotten your herb selection happening and you're ready to complete your witch bottle, holding it in your hands, call to mind your home. Focus your intention on protection. Inside and out, the structure as well as the place where it is. Spend a few moments warding. Imagining this serves as a warding device. Projecting out a force field that prevents catastrophe and negativity from coming to the home. And then with your breath, energize it and call to mind healing, well-being, joy, and other wonderful things you want attracted to your home. Let the power flow into the witch bottle. If you work with a particular form of the divine, call on that form or forms to bless it. And then when you are complete with that, you put on the lid. Now, it can be helpful to have a candle and to kindle the candle and to drip the wax around it. Want to have some newspapers or paper bags or something else to catch the wax so you don't make a mess. And once you have completed your witch bottle, then you figure out where you're gonna put it. Now, if you are in a home that has a front doorstep, bury it near the front entrance if you can. If you're in an apartment and that's not an option, well, perhaps you have an old coat or some other thing that you have in a closet in the front, put it in a pocket. You can put it, it's best to conceal it rather than having it out in the open. It um, lessens the risk of people, you know, connecting with it and messing with it. If you're burying it, take a picture of where you buried it and also make a note of it. Because if you move from that place, it's the responsible thing to do to deactivate it, to dig it up, open it up, return the ingredients to the earth, or you might recycle some of them and carry them with you to your next place. Well, I see I'm almost out of time here, and I want to invite Bob to let me know if there's some questions. I've known of some people who have used them as part of their work. I haven't personally um, used them, but if you feel an affinity for it and it seems to fit what you want to have happen, go for it. And I invite those of you who have been attending this in the next few minutes as I um, do some concluding remarks to think through um, things that we've talked about here and I have explored here and put into the chat something that you've learned, if some new information, some new ideas have risen up with you. As um, with all the workshops that I do, I appreciate feedback and I like to hear what kind of ideas get generated. It might not even be something I said, it might be something that just 
popped up into your mind as a result of this. And as we are concluding, I um, want to invite you to consider protective herb magic during this pandemic time. What? How are you going to do that? Masks are a thing. And one way of being able to enhance the energy and the protective qualities of wearing masks is to take a bit of herbal oil and energize your mask. Now, this is not sufficient to ward off COVID, but masks do a great deal of protecting other people from getting it and to a certain extent, some protection for ourselves. Or instead of using something physical on it, you may want to go out into the garden with your mask and actually touch your mask to some type of plant that you have an affinity towards. Invite the spirit of that plant to guide you in your journeys outside of home to protect you, to guide you. I think it's really important, regardless of what your tradition is, to recognize that mask wearing is something that is one of the three W's of helping to protect ourselves as individuals and other people and the community as a whole from COVID-19. W, wash your hands frequently, 20 seconds at least with good soap, wear a mask and watch your distance. This is really a matter of public health. And I do think at this equinox time, especially as we are going into the tides of equinox, we've got to find some good ways as humans to pull together and mitigate the spread of the virus and to help each other be safe. So avoid large gatherings, wear a mask, wash your hands, watch your distance. I'm so glad you all joined me today. If you'd like some more information about herbal things that I do, workshops and rituals, I um, am part of most of Circle Sanctuary's online celebration of the seasons. I've been to them all so far. And I also do workshops and things and other parts of cyberspace. Indeed, I will be at the Hamilton, Ontario, Canada Pagan Harvest Fest tomorrow afternoon and doing a virtual workshop on honoring the dead at Samhain and being on an international panel that will be I'm taking a look at online rituals and best practices. And in the morning, I'll be at First Unitarian, uh, First Church. Uh, no, it's actually Unitarian Church North tomorrow morning. I've done some work with the First Unitarian um, in another city, but I'll be doing their Sunday service tomorrow, also online. And I do podcasts. On Sunday afternoons, it's Nature Mystic. And on Wednesday nights, it's Nature Spirituality. Thank you all for being here. Thank you, Truly and Hollis, for your leadership and making this all happen. Thank you, Bob, for doing the tech here. Thank you, Casey, for social media work. Thank you, Moonfeather, for evolving your work as our events manager and taking us online during this time. And thank you all who are watching live and watching later for being part of our festival. Happy Equinox.
Hello everybody, my name is Hollis um, and I am going to be talking to you about doorway spells, specifically one doorway spell. Um, we're going to be doing about 45 minutes of this pre-recorded and then towards the end of this around 345-ish, once the video should be wrapped up, I'm going to be hopping onto a live sort of thing in order to answer questions that you might have. Hopefully, I'll be able to cover this well enough that you're not going to have a lot of questions, but I imagine that there will be some. So this particular doorway spell, as you might have noticed, I'm currently not sitting in a doorway. And the reason for that is that I feel like I need to explain a bit about this before we can really get into this. Specifically in that the spell that I'm going to be doing today that I'm going to be walking you through is a part of Romani magic. And Romani magic in general is a closed practice. So what a closed practice is, is that it usually means that people that aren't part of the original culture surrounding that magic uh, aren't necessarily a part of it. So this happens a lot also in voodoo and some Native American practices. A lot of times it's that people inside that practice will choose to either open it to teach it to other people or it remains closed and only people of that culture can really identify with it and be able to practice it. Um, most people who have known me for a moderate amount of time to a long time know that in the past I've talked about Romani magic and I've also talked about it being a closed practice and I've been very adamant about I'm not going to teach it. Um, I've closed it off and I don't really want to talk to people about it. Um, that attitude of mine has sort of changed over the course of this past year during COVID-19. Part of it is that I was talking to some of my cousins um, over the summer and over the spring. And what I found out is that, um, so there are about three of us that know a moderate amount of the sort of like magical practice and sort of like the folklore and folk practices that my grand, that my great grandmother and their grandmother taught them. And the problem is, is that when we talk to each other, we realize I had a moderate amount of, if it was puzzle pieces, I have a large number of pieces one of my cousins has a moderate amount of pieces and uh, my third cousin has maybe like five or six pieces to the puzzle. And we found out that even if we combined all of these pieces together and even talking about practice, there were still some things that my grandmother had neglected to teach any of us or uh, taught my dad, who was also one of the people that she sort of talked to. Um, that meant that a lot of the practices that she had been carrying on both as like an oral tradition and as a tradition uh, that was passed on from her parents um, to her had sort of been lost uh, when she passed away. And I, I came to the realization that over time, especially given kind of um, the issues that Romani are facing in the world now and sort of just like the issues that our world in general is facing, we needed to be able to like talk more about these practices and I want to be able to kind of pass along this practice so that way it doesn't die. Um, but I want to stress even in, in passing on this practice that Romani culture is not a monolith, not at all. Uh, so you have lots of Romani culture um, that's spread out through the diaspora um, that's very, very different. If you sat one Romani person next to another Romani person, it's very, very plausible that they would not have the same belief system at all. Um, in <clears throat> certain parts of the world, like especially in the Middle East, uh, there's a lot of Rom uh, Romani that are practicing Muslims. Um, in Central Europe, you have a lot of Romani that are Catholic. And then in Eastern Europe, you have a lot of Romani that are Eastern Orthodox. And even in England and Ireland, you have Romani that are more like Protestant. And so you kind of, even in general, our culture uh, can't really seem to agree on a certain thing. Like there are a lot of times, like even Romani as a language um, isn't necessarily centralized and there's a lot of different dialects and like a Romani person from Germany might not be able to understand a Romani person from like Romania. Um, and so this also applies to magical practice as well. Very few Romani would actually consider themselves pagan. 
Um, this is similar kind of to when Byron Ballard talks about Appalachian folk magic and the sort of like granny witches of Appalachia that um, were necessarily like practicing Christians um, and believed in Christianity, but still did a lot of like folklore and folk practice in like the 1970s, 1980s, like going on previously to that even. Um, so a lot of us will do sort of like stuff pertaining to superstition and stuff pertaining to practicing magic, but very few of us actually consider ourselves to be pagan. And even f and even in that sort of like group, uh, very few also don't, a lot of us don't consider ourselves to be witches either. <clears throat> so I'm kind of, I'm kind of singular in that sort of, in that sort of practice. And that doesn't really come from me being Romani so much as it comes from uh, other experiences that I've had in my life. So, that being said, the sort of the spell that I'm going to teach you is something that was passed down from my grandmother, uh, or my great grandmother um, was passed down to me. And in me passing it to you, it's sort of evolving in magical practice. And that's something that also has happened in uh, Romani magic over the years is that our practices evolve based on where we're at. Um, who we're interacting with, what sort of things we need to do in order to survive in the environment that we're in. Like a lot of protection spells that we have um, might be based on like whether or not we need to move around, whether or not we're settling kind of like into one area, um, kind of who we're protecting ourselves from or what we're protecting ourselves from. But I'll get into that a little bit more later when I start talking about the items that um, were mentioned for you to gather before the spell and kind of talk about like the significance of each item individually before we really get into it. Um, but just know that like the spell that I'm about to teach you, while it is uh, Romani magic, doesn't necessarily mean that it is a... Um, specific practice that all Romani do and every Romani person that you talk to is going to know how to do it. So now we're going to talk about doorways in Romani culture and magic. So the biggest thing to kind of get into here is the difference between protecting people versus protecting space. So especially during the time when Romani people were much more nomadic, much more nomadic than they could be now with the closing of borders in Europe and kind of the uh, kind of the assimilation that has been sort of like forced upon people in, in order to tell them that they basically have to settle. Um, if you were protecting people, then a lot of times your people were very far flung, widespread. They weren't really around. Um, men were going out of camp to go work. Uh, women were staying more in camp to uh, do sort of like the household, sort of like watching camp and doing that sort of thing. And the biggest thing is that if you were protecting people, it made much more sense to just give people like wards and give people jewelry and give people like sort of significant items they could carry with them or put sort of or put sort of like protective charms like on their clothes or that sort of thing in order to like protect them wherever they're going. So in terms of protecting a doorway, uh, that comes down to protecting space. And a lot of times people, when they think about protection, they think of protection of the self. They think about protection of, um, they think about like carrying protection with you so nothing bad happens to you. But it's also important to have a space where you can feel protected. And so you kind of, you kind of have the ability to, and this is something that carries over a little bit into paganism today where you protect a space, you protect your house. Um, you move into a house and you sage it so that way it's cleansed, so that way you get good energy from that place. Uh, you ward your house so that way nothing, like no robbers come in or like nobody, nobody brings harm to you or your family. It's a really similar sort of practice to Romani magic as well. So the other big thing about protecting space is that space is always moving. Um, so it's always in flux, it's always changing. And so this isn't necessarily a one and done spell, like sort of like when, like I was talking about before, where you cleanse your house when you move in, where you burn something and you sort of like smoke your house so that way, uh, so that way all of the negative energy goes away. Um, this is a spell that is practiced 
regularly, not necessarily, sometimes at the turning of seasons, sometimes at the turning of the year, sometimes even if you're feeling particularly in flux, it can be very grounding and that it's something that you can do when your life is changing week to week in order to give you a little bit of stability. And so the protection of space also is the protection is the protection of things. And when you don't have a lot of things and the things that you have need to be very, very practical, need to have at least two uses in order for them to be useful. And all of it's gotta be packed up into um, a, tr a horse trailer sized wagon then you need to be not necessarily covetous of your stuff, but you need to be protective of your stuff. And so that's also sort of a protection of space is making sure that all of your items that are in the space that you're protecting are going to continue existing um, in their particular space, in their, partic in their particular usefulness, um, and not end up with like, and, and not end up getting walked off with, or also like not getting, not necessarily not getting stolen, but also just not having like any bad energy attached to them. Um, and there's also, and this also shifted in practice quite a bit when Roma, when Romani people went from moving around in Vardos and moving around in, moving around in location to starting to settle into one home. So around the turn of like the 1900s, um, you had a lot of people, especially during the Industrial Revolution, that were having a hard time crossing over borders, um, that were having a hard time, that were having a hard time finding a way to continue the traveling lifestyle in order to like find work, in order to be able to move around um, in a way that was still protective to them. And so you had a lot of people settling. And when you settle into one home, suddenly your priorities become different. And then it becomes, and then it becomes all right, well, every, like, I don't have to worry too much about uh, keeping track of all of my things because I'm allowed to have things that aren't necessarily entirely useful anymore. Um, I can change out things that uh, don't necessarily, like, not, to, to kind of bring some modern sort of uh, idealism into it, like the sort of idea of I can, I can get rid of things that don't bring me joy um, or spark joy. And you kind, of, you kind of had this different mindset of, okay, I don't have to protect the space and I don't have to, and I don't have to worry about the space traveling around with me and things being so changeable. So um, if that makes sense. If not, then ask me questions later and I'll be able to explain it a bit better. Um, the biggest thing is that the doorway spell can basically be any doorway in your home. So it can be the doorway to your bedroom. It can be the doorway to your bathroom. It can be the doorway to your kitchen. Um, it can be anywhere in your home. It can be your front door. It can be your back door. Um, I have known some of my, uh, some of my, uh, relations, uh, one of my cousins will actually use some of it on her windows sometimes too, if she's feeling if she's feeling particularly uh, if she's feeling particularly worried about like anybody coming through her windows. She has like a very large window in her house that could like open up, and theoretically somebody could like come inside it. So she like will put um, charms on that window as well. Um, my father, when he did something similar to this, would use the doorway. Uh, between our living room and our laundry room and the way that our house was set up was that we had we had a living room there was like a small laundry room and then beyond the laundry room was the bathroom and he would always do the doorway uh, between the living room and the laundry room and that seems like a really weird place to put it but the thing with my dad was was that that was actually at like the center of our house like that doorway was smack dab in the center of our house and his idea was that he wanted to push from this sort of like liminal space, he wanted to he wanted to push the sort of protection that he was having on all sides, so that way it sort of like worked as a bubble and like encompassed the house. And when I started doing when I started doing this when I started moving around, I started doing this um, when I was living in apartment buildings. I would do this on the front door of my apartment um, because I not didn't necessarily want to push. 
um, all sides, but I wanted to push everything from like where the doorway was to into my apartment. So it also is important to recognize kind of where in your home you want to put this and how you want that energy to spread out. And that'll be important, um, especially during the uh, doorway um, spell itself, especially when it comes to working with the chalk. And I'll be able to talk a bit more about that when we talk about um, using chalk and this sort of thing. So we're going to now get into the significance of the different items in this spell. So you want to gather your water, your salts, your rag, and your chalk now. So in Romani magic, as far as I have seen it, both from learning from my grandmother and learning from other people, other books about the subject. Uh, the biggest thing is that Romani magic relies very heavily on simple items that everybody has. So this is also similar to what Byron talks about in Appalachian Folk Magic, which by the way, you should really read her book, Stops and Ditchwater, because you'll get a very similar sort of like magical practice in Appalachian Folk Magic to what Romani people do specifically in like using household items, using everyday stuff in order to complete magic. So the first thing that we want to talk about here is water. Specifically what you're putting it in and how important it is. So a little bit of history. Um, Romani camps were generally put by rivers, usually moderately flowing to fast flowing rivers. And the thing is, is that when you're drawing water from a river, there's actually certain sections of the river that you're supposed to get certain sections of water from. So the idea is that water needs to be from a pure and clean source. So it's um, every person in the river would, or every part of the river was doing something different. So at the very mouth of the river, you've got where um, people are washing dishes. Dishes are really important in Romani culture to the point that like we don't actually uh, share dishes a lot of the time. Um, like everybody has a plate, a cup, a bowl, and a set of silverware and like they're yours. And you, and when you are a child, you learn how to wash all of your own dishes and then nobody else touches your stuff. Um, I learned that at a really young age and thankfully I grew out of it because otherwise festival meals would be very, very different for me. Uh, but um, so upriver would be cleaning out dishes and taking care of things. The next part of it would be laundry and taking care of washing clothes, which men's clothes were put higher up river than women's clothes. So, and then women's clothes were put higher up river from the clothes of women who were pregnant or menstruating, which is kind of interesting tidbit. And then children's clothes would be further down river. Then you had like the bathing processes of Romani people. And this is where things get really interesting. Um, horses, would be bathed before anybody else. Horses would be ran through the river further upstream than people were. And that's because horses were very, very important in Romani culture. If your horse got sick, then that was more of a problem to you as somebody who's running a camp than if a person got sick, which sounds terrible and kind of is, but like if you don't have a horse and your horse drops dead, you can't move anymore. So that kind of becomes important. Um, and then you had men bathing, women bathing, and children bathing. And the interesting thing is that um, if you are drawing water for specifically magical purposes, uh, your water comes from the end of this river. So after the laundry, after the dishes, the laundry, the horses, the men, the women, the children, the bathing, all that sort of thing. Obviously, it's not happening at the same time, but the section of river that you would be drawing your water from from magic would come after all of that, specifically because you want water that is sort of like imbued with the essence of your life, of the people that are around you. You want water that is not necessarily, you're not using it for cooking. Um, but you want it to be water that is, um, that sort of has the, the mana, if you will, of the people that you are helping to protect of the things you are helping to protect. And then obviously like the receptacle that you're putting it in 
um, after you are done is going to be washed at the front of the river anyway. So you don't have to worry too much about, okay, I've gathered this water and now I can only ever use this pot for magic. That's not how that works. If you had like just a pot for magic, that would be very, very useless. So we have water. Set that down. All right. Then we have salt. Um, salt is used for everything. You use it to cure meat. You use it to cure hide. You use it in your food. You use it for a multitude of different things. And so, and it's the best way to preserve food that we had for a very, very long time. I mean, if you look up any recipes in the 1930s to the 1940s, you're going to see why they boil everything and suddenly it makes a lot more sense. But so everybody had salt and salt was known to be able to like, keep stuff out. Um, it keeps bacteria out of food. So it keeps rot out of food. It keeps, uh, it like keeps, uh, hides and tanning from like falling apart, that sort of thing. You salt a lot of things. And so it only makes sense in multiple cultures, including Romani culture, that you would put salt into things in order to purify them. So you do that for magic. Um, you have a rag, um, kind of self-explanatory, but it's, again, not necessarily a rag that you would use only for magic. You'd use something that's like a cleaning rag, and then you would just launder it, and then you would wash it again. But the interesting thing about, like, the rag that you're using here is that this also means that you're not necessarily going to have, like, the same level of protection as you would when you're doing the doorway spell. But that also means if you're using this rag for other purpose, then there's sort of, like, a leftover, almost like a remnant of when you're washing something or if you're scrubbing something, and it's sort of, like imbues a little bit of protection into the thing that you are uh that you are working with so that's also a really interesting fun fact about that uh, then we get to chalk so chalk is the most in my opinion the most interesting part about the spell um a lot of people that i have seen especially in the pagan community when they are doing something with doorways or when they're doing something with runes um they have a tendency they'll use like ink or they will carve it into a place this is all well and good, except that eventually you might want to leave this place, or eventually you might want to re-up the thing that you are doing. And so chalk is really interesting because it allows you to write on a surface and then wipe that away. And so like, if you're re-upping a spell, or if you are redoing a spell, or even if you are just changing a spell in general, let's say that I want to um, change sort of the the other components to the spell that I'm doing. Um, you want to be able to just wipe the first one away and start over from scratch. And this is especially important when you are like riding around in a Vardo. And uh, I'm going to have Bob in this portion, thank you Bob, um, put up a couple pictures of Vardos. Um, Vardos are very well ornamented. They are very, uh, they are very detailed in their carving. And you don't really want to damage that kind of beauty with uh, with that sort of like carving something a little more crass into the doorway of your home. So it's really important. Thank you again, Bob, uh, for you to be able to like be able to like take this uh, take this sort of writing away and sort of just like wipe it away and it's also really good for another purpose and i feel like a lot of uh college age or a lot of college age in the closet pagans are going to understand this let's say that you're a romani person that's camping out on the edge of a town and the townspeople are having a lot of bad luck recently and so what they decide to do is that they want to check your camp to see if there are any witches living there all of a sudden you got to make sure that like the pot that you and again and this is why it's really nice to use household items. The pot that you would use to put the rag in and do all the magic just goes with the cooking pots. The rag that you use for cleaning goes with the cleaning rags. The salt goes back on the shelf. And the doorway that you have chalked with your magic spell gets wiped away and nobody is the wiser that you might have enchanted it. And then once the people have gone, they see that there's no witches there, um, and they go on their merry way, that's when you can pull out the chalk again and be like, all right, and let's do it once more. So it's really, really helpful for kind of like 
low-key sort of like in the closet magic too which is really nice for a lot of people um obviously like we have a lot of people at circle sanctuary that are out but i do know a couple of people that have come to festivals over the years that aren't particularly open about being pagan and chalk is a really good way to make sure that you're not going to get caught in the act or whatever and it's also really nice for when you're living in temporary housing like an apartment a college dorm a house that you might one day want to sell to be able to just like not have to worry about um, wiping ink or wiping or trying to figure out how to get rid of a carving that you've put above a door. So the chalk is, the chalk again to me is one of the most important components. These are all, however, base components for a spell. And the biggest thing about Romani, and the biggest thing about Romani magic is that, um, Spells, again, magic is changing. It's an evolving practice. Everybody does things different. So that's, this is when your own personal part of this starts coming in. And so you can put, um, we're going to do the base components today on your end at least, unless you want to like run around really, really quick and grab something that's really, really close to you. Um, but for the base components of the spell, like this is what you need to make the spell work. Now, if you want to add something more to it, um, that is sort of like gives it your own like personal flair, that is entirely okay as well. So like my dad, for example, um, will put like when he's done this before I've seen him put different things in it at one time he put in a drop of shoe shine and did that around the doorway um and obviously the water was enough to dilute it so it wasn't like there was like a ton of shoe shine suddenly like around the door to our laundry room because otherwise my mother would have gotten really really mad um but he wanted to do that because he wanted in this time when he was doing this spell right before um, people were coming to our house. He wanted us to appear presentable and there is nothing to him that makes a person appear more presentable than having well shined shoes, which sounds really weird, but that's my dad. So for me, um, I put, uh, when I'm doing this, I put nails in it. And nails doesn't necessarily equate to bane work, so don't worry too much about that. Um, but I like to have sort of a sharper sort of sense of magic, a sort of sharper like protection. I am a, um, to people that don't know me very well, to strangers, I can be a very aloof sort of prickly person. And I have a persona like that on purpose, so I don't have to worry too much about myself. Oh no, I just dropped one. Um, I'll get that in a minute. Um, I like to have that sort of persona about myself, sort of that air of prickliness, of that sharpness about myself in order to keep myself protected. And so um, sometimes, you know, like I've seen people use like mugwort, um, uh, lavender is another really good one. If you want to kind of have like a sort of like calm, sort of like almost zen-like protection to you. So these are sort of the components that we're going to be working with. So now that all of this is laid out, let's get to the actual doorway spell. All right, everybody. So now we've got our doorway. This is the doorway to my bedroom. As you can see, there is a door jam here. So we've got our doorway, our water, our salt, our hard soled shoes. Wait, that's the wrong chant. Uh, we've got our water, our salt, our rag, our chalk, and then if you have anything that you want to add to it, I have put my nails in my pocket. So kind of just like stick them somewhere on your person that you're not going to forget them. Okay, so you take your water. Um, you just want to put it kind of on the floor in front of where you're working. You don't want to stick it in the doorway with you because that's, be, uh, that's going to be a lot of work trying to get around it. And you're also going to want to keep the floor here around your door clear because you're going to be doing stuff with all four sides of your door. So then you take your salt and you just add in whatever amount feels right. I usually, I have like some really fine like natural sea salt here, but it has a tendency to clump. So I'm just adding it in. Come on. And I won't use all of it because that'll make my roommates mad, but enough that it makes the water cloudy. So then you've got your salt and then you're just going to take 
whatever you have. I have one, two, three, four, five, six. There's one still floating around in there somewhere. And I'd like for it to not stab me later. There it is. I have seven nails here, so I'm just going to one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. And you're probably going to ask me, Hollis, what should I do with these things that I'm putting in here after the ritual is over? And I'm going to show you after the ritual is over. But I will say, before you start dropping anything in, don't put anything in that is super duper important. So like, don't put in your grandmother's locket. That would be a bad idea. So just like things that you wouldn't mind getting rid of. So then you take your rag and you're going to stick it in the bucket. Um, I have really cold water. Um, so, you know, like don't use like boiling water for this unless you really feel like going to the hospital later. Um, so you're just going to stir and kind of like stir in the salt, stir in whatever you've got. You're going to stir clockwise because that's always a good direction to stir things. Um, that's not something that I picked up from Romani Magic. That's just something that I do regularly. Um, so if you wanted to stir Wittershins, I guess you could, but for this practice, I don't see the point of that. You're going to take your rag. There's going to be a lot of excess water dripping from it. And you're just going to like wring that out so that way you aren't like totally dripping. And then you're going to start from your dominant hand, mine is my left, and you're going to go to the top corner of wherever your doorway is. So if you were right-handed, you'd be up here. And you're going to start swiping clockwise. Again, not particularly uh, important in Romani magic, but it is important in at least my magical practice, so that's what I do. And then you swipe clockwise around the area of your door. And if you haven't cleaned your door in a long time, now it's going to be the time that you find that out. And you're going to just go around the edge of your door. And while you're doing this, you're going to think of the intention. You're going to think of what is in the room that you are protecting. And sometimes you might have to like sort of change your position of your hand on your rag, but you always want to keep it your dominant hand. So kind of just swipe up and go around. Once you get back to where you started in a corner, that's your first round done. So you and you're still again like thinking of things that you want to protect in your room or in the place where you are protecting. The things you want to protect, maybe the people you want to protect too. And then you go and you're stirring your rag in your pot again. This is also the time when you find out if you've cut your hand recently because the salt is really going to sting. And then you wring it out again. And this time, you're going to go from the corner that you started at. So again, if you're right-handed, you started in this corner, you're going to go to the next corner over. So if you're left-handed like me, that means you start in the top right corner. If you are right-handed, you're going to go down to the floor. And then you just hit it. And then you start swiping around your doorway again. And again, you're thinking of things that you are protecting. So like for me, this is where I sleep. And so I like to think about all of the things, I would like to think about good dreams. Things don't always have to be material. So you have once again reached the corner that you started at. So then you take your rag and you put it back in the mix and you stir it around again. Bring it out. And again, if you're adding things into this, like herbs, you know, like again, I do nails. Um, this is a good time once you've reached your third corner. So if you're right-handed, you'll be down on the other, on the opposite side of the floor. I'm left-handed, so I have reached this corner. I've just reached the floor. Now you're going to go around. And let's say if your magical practice involves singing, you can do some singing around this point. You can do some chanting. I bet Selena would have a really great chant for this. I'm not much of a chanter myself, so that's not something that I really do. 
Um, sometimes if I'm feeling it, I might hum a tune of some sort, but today's not really that day. So I'm just kind of doing like education while I do this because that's something that I enjoy. So you're back down to your corner again. So stand back up, put your, put your stuff back in the bucket and stir it around again. And if you listen really closely, you can hear the nails swirling around in the bottom of this metal pot that I have. And so now you're at your fourth corner. So I am down here on the floor. If you are right-handed, you're at the corner where I started. So you'll go down to wherever you're at or up to wherever you're at. And once again, we're going to go around the doorway. This is also a really good practice for, again, people who are um, not out because it just looks like you're cleaning. So, all right, we've hit that fourth corner again. Or you've hit that third corner basically by this point because it's one, two, three, four. But then the thing is, is that usually when we'd be doing this, we'd be doing this three times. So it's, it's to make sure that you're getting every possible surface, that you are doing every possible corner. But for the sake of time and brevity, um, we're only going to do this once. But the thing is, is that you always do it, you always do five corners. So you're going to want to do the first corner twice. So you're back up to where you started. And again, if you're right-handed, you'll be back up here. If you're left-handed like me, you started here. So the corner that you started on, you do a second time. And that's basically just to make sure that you've covered all your bases. So if you were doing this three times, and again, we're not going to, because at that point, one, it would get repetitive, and two, time-wise, uh, just not a good idea. Um, you would be one, two, three, four, five, two, three, four, five, two, three, four, five. And basically you do it three times, but at the very, basically at the very end, you would just do the last corner for one final time. So it would actually be, at that point, it would be one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, five. So, all right. So we have gotten this done. And instead of doing it three times, we only do it the once. So then the rag just goes back in the bucket and you just kind of leave it there um, for now because you're not going to need it anymore but you still kind of want it to be imbued with stuff later once you're done. You're gonna take your salt and you're gonna take your whatever. And now I bet you're wondering, but Hollis, where does the chalk come in? And the answer is the chalk comes in now. So you get your chalk and now that you have successfully uh, done stuff to your door, this is going to be the fun part. So if you have a door that actually shuts, you might wanna put your chalk stuff on the door itself and you can maybe if you really really wanted to you could get a ladder and you could do the top part of the door and the side of the door obviously you wouldn't be able to do anything to the bottom um my grandmother used to do this to her front door but she did this regularly and all of the chalk would come off from all of the door opening and closing um, I'm assuming that if you are in the middle of your house and you're not at your front door doing this, you probably would not have a door here, or you might not have a door here. And so for the sake of everybody's sanity, we're not going to do the part with the actual like door. But know that you can, if you really wanted to, just go along the edge of your door and do this. But instead, whatever side you want to do it on, it doesn't really matter. But for me, since I'm living in a house and I'm living with roommates and I don't really want people to see, again, like if you don't want outsiders to see kind of what you're doing, you would do it on the side of the door that's not public facing. So if it was a Vardo, for example, it would be around the edge of the door that's not public facing. So what you're going to do is you're going to take your chalk and you're going to just draw a line that's a zigzag line, and it's a bunch of triangles. And 
And this is so, the edges, from my understanding when my grandmother was teaching me, it's because the edges are jagged and all of the bad things catch on the jagged edges. And I'm just, it sounds like a saw a little bit when you're doing this. And then you get up to the top and you just keep making that sort of edge around the door. I am very short, so I have to stand on my tiptoes to get to the top. And then we come around the other edge of the door, still doing the saw jag here. And there will be some places you'll kind of see here. Also, you don't have to do a continuous line. So if you break it, don't worry. You don't have to start over. You'll kind of see that in some places, and I'll, I'll bring up the camera to show around the edge before, um, but you'll notice with your chalk that some places have a fainter line than others, and sometimes like there are even places where the chalk don't show up. It doesn't matter if the chalk doesn't show, show up. It just matters that the chalk went over it. It doesn't have to be a continuous line. So then, like if your chalk kind of like falters on you at one point and doesn't quite want to go, that's okay. The biggest thing is that if it's faltering on you for a long time, you might want to like move the chalk in your hand to get a better line. So that way you can still at least see where you did it. So coming down the edge of the doorway. And we get to the bottom. And now there's this really, really, I wouldn't say nice, but you know, there's this very obvious line of zigzags around your door. And you're not going to put anything on the floor because that's going to get tracked away pretty easily. But the next thing is that, okay, so we did this around the door. And as you notice, I didn't say it at the very beginning, but I did it clockwise. So you can do it clockwise too, or again, you can do it witter shims, like whatever you want to do. But then after the zigzag line, you're going to start again down at the bottom left corner, since it's clockwise, and you're just going to draw another line straight up. Just whoop, through the middle of the zigzag line. So there's a line. You pick your chalk up, and then you do another line, and you go across the top, and you pick your chalk up, and then you go down around the edges. And the straight line is for like all of the good things to come in. So it's, if you leave it's just the jagged line, then like everything's gonna get caught. But it's the idea that all of the good things are going to come in because not everything's going to get caught because you're seeing some parts of the jagged line are getting, uh, are getting cut off by the straight line. So that's kind of where that is. So this is kind of the design that you're going to have. And again, I'll bring the camera closer and I'll show you um, kind of a close-up shot of it here in a second but you're going to have just a zigzag line with a straight line running through it. And then this is the part, again, if you're really into runes, if you're really into uh, sigils, if you're really into, uh, if you're really into that sort of thing, you kind of want to put it here on the door. And um, I don't really have like any particular practice that means that I really enjoy sigils, like I don't really do runes, anything like that. So I'm going to leave this as it is. And over time, if, and the best part is, over time, if I want to change anything, if I decide that I want to, uh, if I want to redo the spell, which I probably will later, actually I will later because I'm going to show you, um, all I have to do is just wipe off the line. And sometimes, like I'll only wipe one side off so that way again you can see later, sometimes like not all of the chalk will go away, but it's as easy as washing it off with a rag or a clean, or just like water or something like that. So now you have your chalk line. Now here's the fun part. That's when you bring the water back because, oh, you thought you were done with it? No. <laughs> Silly.
Uh, you're going to take your water and again, stir the rag around in it. And we're gonna do the five corners again. And again, if we were doing this as a full on spell, this would be another three times plus the fifth. So start up at your proper corner. Again, if you're right-handed, you're gonna be up here and you're going to swipe around the doorway again. And I'm going to do this much faster than I did before because I'm assuming that you all got it the first time. And so like, also to kind of show you if I'm not talking and explaining through it, how quickly this can be done. Because my grandma, when she did this, used to be able to do this wicked fast. It was almost impressive. And again, she's doing it like three times. So it would be really fun to watch her do this. And you would hear her old granny bones creaking when she would just be bending her knees all the time to get to the bottom doorway. And again, this is a really good way to figure out if you have washed your doorway recently. And then again, I just did the bottom left corner, but we make sure to do all five. So then we're back up here again and we swipe around and then back up. And that's how you do a Sinti Manoush Romani doorway. So this is a closer look since I reviewed the last video and realized that you can't really see it from afar. This is a closer look of kind of how my zigzaggy and straight lines look. And again, does not have to be perfect. It just matters that it was once there. So then you have all of that all the way around your door. And then this is what it looks like kind of when you just like erase it with your hand. And again, like some parts of it will linger behind, but you can wipe those away with a rag and it won't stay. It's chalk. You've been to school. You know what it's like. So you don't really have to worry too much about it sticking around, not like ink or like carving wood. So just to let you see kind of what that looks like. Also, I almost forgot, this is what you're going to do with the water that's left over. So basically every Romani camp kind of had an edge of camp area where they would take things. Um, this is my house. So I just took it down to the curb here and I'm going to fish out the rag because I would like to keep that. Because again, you can use it to like imbue protective qualities, but you kind of just want to squeeze it out and kind of like get the water out of it and I'm going to sit it on my shoe so that way it doesn't get uh, too bad. And then basically you're going to take everything in it, including whatever you uh, put in it, and you're just going to dump it out. And I have like those seven nails that I put in it and they're just kind of sitting there. You're just going to uh, leave them at least for a little while. Um, if they're like really bad for the environment, like those nails, for example, I probably don't want to leave them for a very long time. Um, leave them kind of overnight and then you should have uh, you should have the ability to come back and pick them up later, but you are going to throw them away. And from um, and from Bob is the uh, kind of the nudge to explain why I was using the term Romani when I was talking about when I was talking about magic here. So, um, speaking as somebody who is Romani and speaking as somebody who comes from this culture, um, sometimes, especially in American culture, we have a tendency to really romanticize the word gypsy, and that's actually not a good word to use. 
Um, and it's one of those words that like, it's, it's very much a slur, but people don't really understand why it's a slur or, and people don't really understand why they shouldn't use it. And so I could get into like really, really deep etymological sort of like nuance about it, but we only have like 10 minutes and other people have questions. So I'm not going to get super deep into it, but basically where the term gypsy comes from is the idea that Romani people originated in Egypt. And this isn't true. And then it was kind of, and it's kind of been bandied about whether Romani people said that they originated in Egypt when actually they didn't, or whether we were assigned that role because of things that were going on with Egypt and the Ottoman Empire at the time um, that made uh, the English think that we were Egyptian because more Egyptian people were actually immigrating to England. And in other locations, you know, in um, Spain, uh, we were called uh, flamencos, which is where flamenco dancing comes from. Most people don't know that. And that's because we came from the Flemish region. For them, um, Romani like sort of originated from the Flemish region of, um, of Holland. And in uh, France, we were called Bohemians because we came from the kingdom of Bohemia. And so like there's, there's a bunch of different names for us that don't actually use the name that we have for ourselves, which is Romani, which comes from the word Rom, which is, which comes from a more like Indo-Aryan root of the word, of the word Dom, which is from, um, which is from like a Western area of India. And so a lot of, and so Romani people are actually just like travelers that kind of like came, nomadic people that came from India and sort of like migrated their way across the Middle East and into um, and into Europe. So when people think that Romani people are Romani because they can't because they come originally from Romania, that's not true either. So that's sort of that's sort of why I use the term Romani instead of the word gypsy because that's the word that we use for ourselves. And it's also just it's got a very negative connotation. You don't really see it a lot here in the United States, but Romani people are extremely prejudiced against in uh, Europe. So I try to I try to educate people on why this word shouldn't be used in a in a broader context. So um, let's see what's going it's on. Also just, it's, um, so let me start asking people questions, uh, or let me see if I can start uh, getting questions answered, um, and see what and see what we can do here. So let's see. Um, the first question that I have is question for Hollis. When drawing the straight line through the zigzag line, why is it important to pick up your chalk at the corners? Um, I think that this originates uh, from my grandma when she would do her lines on the door. Um, she had like a very ornate doorway um, that was like a Vardo. And so, uh, and so she like basically had like all of these designs on her doorway and that sort of thing. And so it can be really, it could be really difficult for her to uh, draw the line straight up. And then in the corner, when you have like all of these, like, it's kind of like when you have all of these like designs in the corner of a doorway, we, there are some doors that have that here, um, like, like circles or like they have like the blocks that are there. Um, it can be very difficult to just take your take your chalk and run all the way up there and then kind of have to like finagle around the design and then run across the middle and then finagle with the design in the other quarter and run all the way down. Um, so it's not necessarily like a magical intention of, oh, I'm going to pick it up here and then I'm going to draw and I'm going to pick it up here and I'm going to do that. That's actually that was probably more of a aesthetical choice on my grandma's part in the sense of just like she doesn't want to she doesn't want to work with all of the uh, doorway corners in order to get them uh, in order to get them um situated uh um can you do multiple doorways or just one you can do multiple doorways in your house um with and you can do a doorway if, and especially if you have multiple people living in a house um you can have a doorway that like can just be for protecting your room if you have kids your kids can do this for their own rooms um if you have a if you have um, like a particular spell that you want to place on your room, but then you have something that you want to place like on your house as a whole, you can do your bedroom and you can do your doorway. Just the biggest thing is that like for me, um, I usually stick to one door strictly because um, like with my grandmother's practice again, like she spent most of her um, youth 
when before she moved to the United States, she spent part of her youth like in a Vardo, um, in like a wagon sort of situation. And so she only had one door. And so my grandma only ever did anything with one door because that was the only door that she had. And then when she actually moved into a house and she kind of like moved and like got situated there, she still only did everything with one door because like I said, you can kind of, um, uh, you can push the protection sort of like on both sides of the doorway. It's a liminal space where the projection or where the protection sits, but you can kind of put it, like I said, with my dad, he kind of like put it in the laundry room and it kind of spread over the entirety of the house. Um, but he just wanted that point as it's kind of a central point in our house and it's a doorway that everybody went through. Um, because like my sister and I, when we lived upstairs and uh, our rooms were up there, he didn't really go up there a lot. Um, he didn't want to put it in like his bedroom because like nobody really would go into his room and he didn't want to put it in the uh, doorway to the outside just because he wanted to be able to have like a central point in the house. So it was either the laundry room or the kitchen and my dad didn't want all of this chalk and all of this salt water and shoe polish or whatever he was using at the time um, in his kitchen doorway, which is right next to the stove. So the laundry room was the next choice. Um, so like there, he kind of, uh, he would kind of just do it there for whatever purpose, but like my sister and I could have like put protections on our rooms too. It really doesn't, it really doesn't matter. Um, like you can do multiple times, um, miss the part. Why five times is one of the questions and I'm trying to think because I recorded this a few days ago. And so I'm trying to think why five times what, and I think that it's, I think it's in reference to, um, I think it might be in reference to the doorway. Oh, oh yeah, no, it's in reference to the, it's reference to the five times. Okay, so um, if you're in a door and there's four corners and you start in this corner, um, you go around one way and then you start in this corner and you go around again. Um, the fifth corner is just to make sure that everything's sealed. So you, if you have four corners, you're going to do the first corner that you start with twice. And that's just so that way you're covering all of your bases. So that way you have, so that way, um, it kind of feels like that's the way that you, uh, that's the way that you close the circle because you can go one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, um, or no, one, two, three, four, but that kind of leaves like that last corner of the door kind of, um, like kind of still a little bit open. So it's nice to go around for a fifth time to make sure that you've covered everything. I don't know if that makes sense as an answer, um, but hopefully like that works out well. So yeah, and then I see that we had some issues with sound, but they got fixed. So hopefully that like was helpful and yep, Bob's giving me the thumbs up, so that's good. So yeah, um, we are just about ready to do the Equinox ritual. And again, thank you guys so much. Thank you all so much for um, coming out and uh and i guess it's not really coming out it's sitting here but thank you for uh watching our uh festival and thank you for being here and yeah all right thank you all so much bye Welcome fall. My name is Reverend Florence Edwards Miller, and I'm so glad that you've joined me today for our ritual. We'll begin by cleansing ourselves and the space that we'll be working in, wherever you are. The simple chant. 
The world before me is restored in beauty. The world behind me is restored in beauty. The world above me is restored in beauty. The world below me is restored in beauty. My spirit is restored in beauty. The world before me is restored in beauty. The world behind me is restored in beauty. The world above me is restored in beauty. The world below me is restored in beauty. My spirit is restored in beauty. The world before me is restored in beauty. The world behind me is restored in beauty. The world above me is restored in beauty. The world below me is restored in beauty. My spirit is restored in beauty. It is finished in beauty. It is finished in beauty. It is finished in beauty. Thank you. Together we have gathered to celebrate the coming of the fall equinox. This is a liminal time between summer and winter when things are in transition. And we gather to celebrate, to honor, to deepen our connections with each other and with the place that we're in. So in just a moment, as we continue with our ritual, we will call in the divine in various forms, including we are going to connect with the sacred land that we are in, both the sacred land that I'm here, right here at Circle Sanctuary, and the sacred land that you are on right now, wherever you are. We'll also connect with the guardian spirit of your household, because whether or not you're in contact with one, it's there. So we're going to honor it and thank it for the protection that it's been giving you now and in the times to come. And we're also going to take a moment to honor something else that's been giving real protection to both ourselves and our community. Those masks that we're all wearing these days. We're going to take a moment to bless those and carry a little bit of this Mavin magic with them in the months to come. Thank you again for joining me. Take a moment, center yourselves, and let's begin. The first thing that we're going to do is to cast the circle. Now, normally when we can be here together physically at Circle Sanctuary, we often cast the circle hand to hand. I take your hand, you take my hand, we pass the energy between us. But just because we're separated by distance doesn't mean that we can't still do that because we know that we are connected to one another no matter where we are. So right now we are going to cast the circle hand to hand. Whenever you are listening to this, wherever you are, what I want you to do is take a moment, breathe, center yourself, and I want you to reach out for the person next to you and take their hand. Feel my hand in yours. Feel your hand in mine. Know that we are connected by love and by spirit wherever we are. And feel the circle of all of our hands, one with another, connecting us in a great circle of light that protects us brings us together in the sacred space and holds this place for us now in this ritual. Together, we'll chant it. Hand to hand, the circle is cast. 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 Can we go now? So mote it be. And now together, we invite into our circle the spirits of the directions, the elemental forces that are part of the natural world and part of us. And in the circle sanctuary tradition, we begin with north and earth. We call to the spirits of north and earth, solid ground, strong mountains, deep valleys, the prairie, the land that is beneath our feet, the solid strength of our bodies, be with us now and in the time to come. So mote it be. And now we turn to the east 
and the element of air. Gentle breezes, strong storms, you who carry the clouds above us, and you who are the breath within our bodies. Come, be with us now and in the times to come. So mote it be. And now we turn to the south and the element of fire. South and fire, warm sun, flickering candle, communal campfire, the vitality within our bodies and ourselves. Be with us now and in the time to come. So mote it be. And we turn to the west and the element of water. Water and west, gentle rain, flowing stream, misty mornings. You who are the blood in our hearts and in our veins, be with us now and in the time to come. So mote it be. And now, in the tradition of Circle Sanctuary, we call, in addition to the four traditional elements, we also call the cosmos above and the earth below us. We call to the sky, to the cosmos, to that which is above us, clouds, planets, atmosphere, space, that which crowns us all. Be with us now and in the times to come. And we call to the land, the earth beneath our feet, the planet that sustains us. Be with us now and in the times to come. And just as we cast our circle hand to hand, we call to the spirit of community that which sustains and remains no matter how far apart we are. Be with us now and in the times to come. So mote it be. And now we call to the divine. We know the divine by so many faces and so many names. Today, I'm going to call the divine as goddess as God and as spirit. And as we call these, I invite you to call the divine as you work with it in your own tradition into the space. As I chant, I'm going to be using this rattle, which I totally stole from my daughter's musical instrument bit. And during that time, connect with the divine as you understand it and invite it to be with you, invite them to be with you in your own space for your ritual. I call to the goddess. Goddess, we welcome you. Goddess, we welcome you. Goddess, we welcome you. Goddess. We welcome you, God. 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 We welcome you. Great Goddess, Mother. Come to our circle today. Be with us now and in the times to come. So mote it be. And now we call to the God. God, we welcome you. God, we welcome you. God, 
we welcome you, God. 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 We welcome you. Great God, Father, be with us now and in the time to come. And now we call the Spirit, the divine in so many forms, call it into our circle today. Spirit, we welcome you, Spirit. 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 We welcome you. Divine Spirit, that which is within and around us, we call you into our circle today. Be with us now and in the time to come. So mote it be. And now, let us introduce ourselves to the land that we're on. There's a simple way. Imagine that you're going over to a neighbor's and you're going to introduce yourself. Do you just walk up and talk? No, you knock on their door first. So the very first thing that I want you to do, depending on your ability, is take a moment and give the land beneath you or the floor beneath you a good couple of taps. If for some reason you're not able to do that, you can clap your hand three times. So together, we're going to go. One, two, three. Clapping or tapping is a technique that's used in a lot of traditions, including Shinto, as a way of telling the spirit that you're communicating with that you'd like to talk. Once we have knocked on the door, and we introduce ourselves. So take a moment and in your heart or out loud, introduce or reintroduce yourself to your sacred land. Who are you? Where did you come from? What is your story on this land? Acknowledge the people that were here on this land before you. Acknowledge the plants and the animals, the habitat that was here on this land before you. Acknowledge the sacredness and the importance of this land. And now, Give thanks. Give thanks to the land for being your home, for being the place that is sustaining you right now. Give thanks to the land for all it has given you and continues to give. Give thanks for being part of its story, which is so very much older than all of us. 
give thanks to the land. Now that we've introduced or reintroduced ourselves, if you feel comfortable doing so, let's do a chance to help us deepen our connection with the sacred land that we're in. If you don't feel like the land is welcoming that, this is an okay part to skip. The land is an entity. It has agency and choice in this. But if you felt a connection there before and you feel that you're ready, join in with this. Otherwise, you just continue to work on that relationship and come back to this another time. One of the best ways that I found to connect with the land wherever I'm at is actually a song that I sing with my daughter and the kids at Circle Sanctuary and Pagan Spirit gathering a lot. It's a song by a wonderful artist, children's artist called Sarah Purtle, and we're just going to do the chorus. It's called My Roots Go Down. I'll sing it. If you're in a place where you feel able to sing, please join in. Nobody's listening. My roots go down, down to the earth. My roots go down, down to the earth. My roots go down, down to the earth. My roots go down. My roots go down, down to the earth. My roots go down, down to the earth. My roots go down. Down to the earth, my roots go down. My roots go down. Down to the earth, my roots go down. Down to the earth, my roots go down. Down to the earth, my roots go down. My roots go down. Down to the earth, my roots go down. Down to the earth, my roots go down. Down to the earth, my roots go down. One more time. My roots go down. Down to the earth, my roots go down. Down to the earth, my roots go down. Down to the earth, my roots go down. My roots go down, down to the earth, my roots go down. Down to the earth, my roots go down. Down to the earth, my roots go down. Feel your roots. Send them deep into the earth. Take that connection. Mm -hmm. It could feel like your roots holding tight to the soil. It could feel like you holding the hand of a friend. Honor that connection. Give thanks for that connection. And give thanks for your sacred land. So mode it be. But in an animistic worldview, where everything has a spirit or a little god, then our houses have a spirit or a little god. Our household, whether that's a whole house, whether that's an apartment, whether that's an RV, wherever it is that you and your family group spend your time and consider home, that has a spirit. And it's a spirit that you can connect with. And it's a spirit that you can work with. And it's a spirit that you can empower to be an ally for you and your household. So we're going to take a moment in our Mabin celebration to connect with our household God. I've actually brought out here on the road the symbol that I use for my household God. This is a statue. But this statue of a snake is what sits at my hearth and it's what I visualize and work with when I work with my household God. So 
whether you already have a tradition of working with your household God, or you're introducing yourself for the first time, I want you to take a moment and either, and visualize how you see that. It could be an actual icon, it could be something that you put in your mind, but visualize what your household God, what your household guardian looks like for you. Take a moment. And now that you have that visualization in your mind's eye or at your fingertips, we're going to take a moment to greet that house with God. In the Shinto influence tradition, we might clap three times or we might touch our icon, we might bow or we might simply Greet them in our hearts. I'm going to clap. You can clap with me. Or do whatever your tradition suggests. Now, honor your household God. Thank it for protecting you and protecting your household. Blessed be the household guardians. Blessed be the household guardians. Blessed be the household guardians. And now let's take a moment to bless and honor something that has become an unexpectedly important part of our lives. Our masks. In the past six months, masks have gone from being something that most of us didn't have to think about on a day-to-day -day basis to being an absolutely critical part of our lives and every time we go out of the house. So in this equinox tide, let's take some of that potent magic and use it to bless and honor these masks, which are such an important part of our life. You can bless your masks in many different ways. If it feels right to you, you can take some incense and you can smudge your masks. If you're sensitive to smoke, you might want to skip that. You can take oil, which is what I'm going to do, and use it to lightly anoint your mask. If you do it with a mild, light oil, then you've got the benefit of just being able to smell that a little bit every time you put the mask on, and that can help you remember the magic that you did and that you imbued your mask with. Again, though, we want to be practical here. If you think that is going to exacerbate a respiratory condition, don't do it. You can absolutely bless your masks with water or with a favorite crystal or whatever is right for you. But so take your mask or masks. I've got a lot of the masks for my entire household here and you can put them in front of you on the altar in this sacred space. And I want you to take a moment and imagine yourself glowing with light of vitality, of health and of strength. And we're going to put that into the nest. So breathing it in and breathing that vitality that strength, that protection out into our masks. And now, however you're going to do it, with incense, with oil, with water, with wand, with stone, or just with spirit, Take your tool of choice and just lightly anoint your mask. You can draw a pentacle on it. Spirit 
a powerful symbol of protection, or any other symbol that is meaningful for you for protection. I'm going to hold this mask. You can hold all your masks. This is one that my daughter uses. And we're going to imbue these masks with protection and love. 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 So mode it be. And now it's time for us to round ourselves out and give thanks. Give thanks for this season that we are in. Give thanks for being together and give thanks for the sacred time of the fall equinox. In many traditions, we do cakes and ale, but for this particular moment, one thing that I find to be very seasonal are apples. Where I'm at, apples are just becoming ripe and my family picked this apple about a week ago. With this apple, I have honey and cinnamon. In the Jewish tradition, we're about to celebrate Rosh Hashanah, where honeys and apple are traditional, and honey is sacred in many, many traditions. Bees. This is actually local honey from the same orchard where I picked the apples. Cinnamon is a wonderful herb associated with the sun and is sacred in, in many traditions. It's just so yummy. So I invite you now, wherever you are, if apples and cinnamon and honey aren't your thing, do whatever is right for you. But take something that's nourishing, preferably something that's just a little bit healthier, you can convince yourself that it is. And something that's delicious, and if you can, something that's local. And something that has a little bit of the sweetness of the summer months that are going behind, going past, and something that has just a little bit of the spices of winter to come. Take that and give thanks. Give thanks for all of the bounty of the land that nourishes us, and give thanks for the season. You can eat as much as you like, but be sure to save some and give it as an offering in a way that's safe for the land and the animals around you. But share this feast in whatever form that it takes with the divine in the ways that we've called it today. I'll be leaving this as a gift here on the land, and I invite you to do the same. Thank you for being part of our circle today. It's time for us to end and give thanks to all who have been part of our circle this afternoon. We give thanks to the divine forces that we have called today. We give thanks to our household gods in whatever form that they take. We give thanks, we give thanks, we give thanks. And we give thanks to the spirits of the divine. We give thanks to spirit. We give thanks to the god. We give thanks to the goddess. By all the many names and faces that we know them. We give thanks. We give thanks. We give thanks. We give thanks to the directions 
that we have called day. We give thanks to the cosmos and that which is above. And we give thanks to the land, both the sacred land where you are right now, and to the whole planet which supports and sustains us. We give thanks to the elements that we have called. We give thanks to the north and earth. We give thanks to the east and air. We give thanks to the south and fire. And we give thanks to the west and water. We give thanks. We give thanks. We give thanks. And we give thanks to one another, to the spirit of community, to this sacred circle that we have created together. Just like in the beginning, where we cast the circle hand to hand, I want you to reach back out. And I want you to feel my hand in yours, your hand in mine, all of us, our hands connected and our hearts connected. Even as we leave this circle, we know that we are connected to one another and that we are with each other now and that we will be with each other in the future. For it is time for our circle to be open. It is never broken. Mary meet and Mary part and Mary meet again. You have to say it again. Though it's time for our circle to be open, it is never broken. Mary meet, Mary part, and Mary meet again. Thank you. Blessed be.